Good morning. The District Court of Appeal of the State of Florida and in for the Second District is now in session. The Honorable Edward C. LaRose, Judge Presiding. Those having business before this court, draw near, give attention, and you will be heard. May God save the United States of America, the State of Florida, and this Honorable Court. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual setting of the Second District Court of Appeal. We have five cases on the docket this morning. We will take them in the order in which they are listed. Each side has 20 minutes. If you are the appellant and wish to reserve up to five minutes in rebuttal time, please let me know and uh, we will accommodate you. Our first case on the docket this morning is Tidewater Preserve Master Association versus Florida Department of Transportation. Mr. Brigham. Good morning. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to reserve five minutes for my rebuttal. Okay. Five minutes for rebuttal. Mr. Brigham, we're ready to go when you are. Thank you. Good morning and may it please the court. Uh, my name is Andrew Prince Brigham. I'm with the Brigham Property Rights Law Firm. We represent the appellant. It's a HOA, Tidewater Preserve Master Association, Inc. Uh, Pursuant to Rule 1.211, Floor Rule Civil Procedure, uh, we represent the association, which means we represent 650 uh, or more property owners. Uh, these 650 property owners uh, are requesting that the court reverse the order of taking that was entered below on December 18th, uh, 2020. Uh, at, the, at the root of this case, at the very source of the dispute, in eminent domain jurisprudence, we have a matter that is about conceptual severance. And that involves the defining of a larger parcel or a parent track with respect to what is the property that has been impacted by an eminent domain taking. It may be helpful. Uh, the facts of this case uh, are likely familiar to this court. If uh, driving on I-75 and crossing the Manatee River on the east side of the highway on the south bank, there is Tidewater Preserve. It's a master plan community. The DOT in this case, as the condom nor and the appellee, are taking common area from the homeowners association. The common area is uh, most used as Tidewater Boulevard, which is actually the uh, only means of ingress and egress to the community on either side of I-75. This private way of access goes underneath the highway. DOT will need to acquire uh, temporary construction easements to encumber this land for six years while performing kind of their air, sea, land campaign to build these bridges. And additionally, the taking involves uh, an area where the private developer and prior to the purchase of many of these homes, uh, the there was a construction of a berm, it's 11 feet high and a wall 10 feet high, whose purpose was to uh, buffer the community from the existing improvements of I-75. Importantly, the taking of the homeowners association's property in this common area will be used to construct uh, the northbound off ramp. Uh, the DOT will be building two new bridge structures, and in this on the east side of I-75 will be a, an off ramp for the US 301 Manatee uh, County interchange with I-75. Um, Your Honors, that's the facts. Again, back to the central issue. Uh, again, this is an issue about how do you define the parent track? We have alleged that there was a substantial, there was not substantial competent evidence for the court to find that the appraisal upon which the DOT uh, based its initial offers or entered into its declaration of taking was in good faith. Uh, it was in bad faith and it was invalid. And that's Mr. essentially- Brigham, let, let me see if I could try to distill your, your position is that you have issue with uh, Mr. Sparks' opinion, I gather, based on, on, on what you set forth in your brief. And um, so that's really the crux. I think it's your position that Mr. Sparks should not have been allowed to testify in the manner which he did. And if you push that aside, there would, would not be any type of substantial competent evidence to support the trial court's decision. I'm just paraphrasing in a nutshell, at least that's, that's at least your position. Am I understanding it correctly? 
uh, Judge Guzam, I would say that the, the admission of his testimony wasn't at issue. We did not move in, in Lemony. We did not move a Daubert. This is a bench trial. It's not a jury trial. Uh, 74.051 has always established uh, what the process of a hearing of order of taking for quick taking must do. It's a bench trial. And, and again, we have a two-tier model where the burden shifts, public purpose, reasonable necessity has to be shown by the condemning authority. Then as the owner, uh, you have to look at bad faith, illegality, abuse of discretion. Here, we wanted the evidence of the appraisal to be in evidence. We wanted to cross-examine it. We wanted to make arguments. We wanted to preserve a record because we believe that the parent track that the DOT used and the across the fence uh, methodology uh, is, is invalid. Uh, it's, it's defining the taking as being the common area. Imagine a, a, the DOT having discretion to take property from a shopping center for the parking lot. It's common area. And I, and I understand that, but isn't that more appropriate, if I may, Mr. Brigham, like in cross-examination? You've indicated it is a bench trial. The judge is hearing the testimony and the give and take, and this will be fodder for cross-examination. You know, judge, we, uh, you question the witness, you question that. Isn't that more appropriate for cross-examination purposes as opposed to simply do away with this whole entire, you know, testimony? Your, Your Honor, really, the the issue that you're raising is uh, when when we presented a appraisal valuation on both sides, either, either side should be able to present their their best case in court. We have the opportunity to to present uh, uh, impeachment and rebuttal testimony, but here the the invalidity of the appraisal it defies uh, controlling law. What is a parent track is a matter of law. In, in federal jurisprudence, the Supreme Court just decided the Murr versus Wisconsin case. That's a regulatory taking. The argument of the owner was to include two lots, one with a house, one without. The owner was trying to show a complete loss of economic beneficial use, one of the Penn Central factors. Uh, the court said, no, you can't separate the two lots, consider them separately, they must be combined. That's the court policing parent track to make sure that the owner doesn't overreach. Similar but, but cases- Mr. Brigham, in, there, there, yes, sir. as I understand it, there was no, there was no argument that the, the method that the appraiser used were ex, was an acceptable method. Your Honor, it, it is a recognized method, but it's unacceptable when you're appraising something other than a, a rural corridor for a railroad or, or a transmission line. Your Honor, the, the across the fence methodology assumes absolutely categorically excludes consideration of any improved property on either side of the corridor. By definition, it's trying to get the dirt value only and, and does not look to the improved value. So using that method in a partial taking case where there is always going to be the impact of severance damage, you know, this is a highway that is coming five feet from the remainder property's property line. The bridge structure is built on the property taken, unlike Butler Carpet, where the taking uh, was not uh, used for the purpose of any highway construction. Here, a bridge will be put five feet from the property line. It will be higher in elevation than the buffer wall that the developer put in. So these homeowners who look immediately to I-75 will no longer enjoy in the after condition the same buffer that they had in the before. So here the department comes and, and where's the prejudice to the owner? Remember, it was in uh, July 1st of 2000 that the uh, new legislation took uh, effect and they created the Florida legislature in 1999, passed a bill to require pre-suit negotiations. This, uh, the, the legislature considered what are the con constitutional parts of, of what is good faith negotiations. Central to that, you must have a written offer if you're a condemning authority, it must be based on a valid appraisal. Look at this case. The initial offer was in 2017. There were seven different appraisals leading up to the date of taking in December of 2020. This case never got on track. The owner never had the opportunity to, to sit down with the department and negotiate at any other position than the department saying there are no severance damages. And well, maybe, there are, that's, maybe that's a good thing for your clients because at the end of the day, you're gonna have a trial where the amount of full compensation is going to be decided. And if, and if the Department of Transportation chose not to engage in what you call is you know, good faith negotiation, well, 
that's their pick. You're going to have a chance to, to make your case on full compensation. Your, your Honor, I, I think the uh, uh, I would I would say that that argument is kind of like we'll fix it later. In other words, you'll have you're, you're not being prejudiced, property owner, because you will ultimately have full compensation determined by the valuation stage of an eminent domain case. But, Your Honor, I ask you to consider why did the legislature say that the written offer had to be based upon a valid appraisal? Why is well, it in Mr. the statute? Mr. Brigham, I, I think that's an important point, actually. It needs to be a valid appraisal. And so far from your argument, I've heard you explain why it might be an inaccurate appraisal or, or, or you disagree with the appraisal or experts can differ. But what is it that makes it invalid as opposed to merely say, ultimately inaccurate? Uh, your Honor, I think, I think we can look to Armadillo, which is the case that would be cited most to say that these questions are questions of weight for the jury to decide when there's competing valuation theories. But Your Honor, I would say that in this case, in this context, uh, look at the dissent uh, by Judge Lewis in the Armadillo case that was joined by Judge Justice Wells and Justice Shaw. Very importantly, this is the type of mistake that's wholesale. This is not the appraiser such as in the Falcon case who made a mistake about uh, verification of a comparable sale. That should go to the, the fact finder. That should be competing in terms of uh, the two positions but of the parties. Uh, likewise, Rochelle, which was another case by the second DCA that the Supreme Court and Armadillo said, we want these matters to go to the jury. That was where uh, interchange uh, on the turnpike uh, taking, uh, we were looking at comparable sales at, at different interchanges. That too, matter of weight for the jury. The, the cases that Armadillo distanced itself from and changed in terms of eminent domain law was that uh, when it involved a cost to cure where uh, damages to the remainder property were mitigated by a cost to cure and the lesser of severance damages and cost to cure are, are to be paid as compensation. That too is wait for the jury. This, however, is radioactive. This is a wholesale invalidity. Appraisers should not use across the fence in partial takings of common areas. This is bad policy. This is bad law. In a if case I may, where- if if I may, Mr. Brinker, I know you've mentioned uh, the the armadillo, and I know you make a reference to the dissent, but if you look at the actual majority, that case was even uh, the, the appraiser's valuation method, as I understand, it emitted actually a factor. And even for that, the court came to the conclusion that this exclusion affected the weight and not the admissibility of his testimony. And so it actually goes contrary to the position that, 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 that you're taking right now. And I think the bottom line is, and I appreciate the fact that the dissent said what they did, but we have to look at the majority opinion in this case, which then brings it back to full circle where Mr. Sparks' testimony and I go back to that because you're dealing with one judge, it's a non-jury, you brought up all these issues regarding the weight of his testimony, why his weight, and it goes back to what Judge Rothstein, Joachim just indicated, that the, the, the inaccuracy as opposed to the invalidity, which really goes down to its core. That's where I'm having a, a concern with. So help me out with Armadillo. Does Armadillo support your position or does it really go contrary to, to the position that you're taking? Judge Kuzam, I agree with you that Armadillo uh, is contrary to my position if, if there's no instance where the court steps in and says that uh, testimony is incompetent. But Your Honor, I believe that, that uh, uh, when we decided Armadillo, the Supreme Court, we were, we were under a Fry standard. The pendulum is somewhat swinging back now and we're going to a Daubert standard. But importantly, if looking at the cases that Armadillo is based on and the issues, these are issues of weight for the jury. There are mistakes in the appraiser's uh, appraisal, but they're not wholesale invalidity of the appraisal. Look to the cases that deal with parent track. The court steps in and throws out the entire appraisal because the parent track does not meet the jurisprudence of eminent domain law. And that's what we have going on here. So that's the big distinction between the type and kind of cases that Armadillo says should be given as questions of weight for the trier fact. But here, look at Jyrick. Look at what constitutes the unities of a parent track, common ownership, contiguity, 
and then use and look at where the appraiser here cannot make a competent statement that that the parent track should be 6.86 acres of 327 uh, acres of a residential subdivision. Imagine if you're the owner of a property and you have a home and you have an appurtenant right to a berm that protects you and screens you from the interstate. And, and the state is taking your property, your common area, and instead of your berm to screen your home, you, you now have a, a bridge structure that is you know, just a few feet away. Your value in your remainder property goes down. But alas, the DOT is saying that in any type of these eminent domain partial takings, because we're just taking odds and ends and little pieces, if we take the parking lot from a shopping center, uh, we can't find any sales of severed parking lots. So let's use the across the fence method. And that way we don't have to look at any damages to the inline shopping center tenants. We can just pay for the parking. That's what's going on here. And what I'm saying back to Judge LaRosa's comment, this is prejudicial. This started in 2017, seven different appraisals. These owners, if they had some leverage at the table, if DOT did not say zero severance damages, they may have persuaded the DOT to include in their plans a, a buffer sound wall. The DOT does for not you, get paid. Excuse me yes. for interrupting you, but you, you are into your rebuttal time. So proceed Thank you, as Honor. you wish. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Peoples, let me get my clock working here and we'll be ready to go. Okay, we're ready when you are, sir. Good morning, may it please the court. I'm Mark Peoples for the Florida Department of Transportation. Your honors, it's undisputed that the standard of review is whether the order is supported by competent substantial evidence. And that means if there is competent substantial evidence in the record to support the order, this court must affirm even if there is other competent substantial evidence that would justify a different finding. Um, you've heard Mr. Brigham say that the, that the central issue is whether the methodology that Mr. Sparks used was valid, whether the appraisal was valid. Under Florida law, and this is also undisputed, the, the test for the validity, the competence, of an expert's testimony is Daubert. It was incumbent upon Tidewater to timely raise a Daubert challenge and request a Daubert hearing if they wanted to challenge Mr. Sparks's methodology and competence. Mr. Brigham didn't do that. There was no Daubert challenge raised below, no Daubert hearing was held below, so the issue is not preserved for appeal. Not only that, the issue wasn't raised in the initial brief, so the issue was abandoned on appeal. But even if the court does consider the validity, competence of Mr. Sparks's testimony, um, the, the governing standard is the Armadillo case, which Judge Kuzum has discussed at some length. Um, these are all quintessential issues of weight, not admissibility. When Mr. Brigham decided to cross-examine Mr. Sparks, and, and as Mr. Judge Kuzum indicated, there's ample fodder cross-examination. If, if he wanted to explore the disagreements with his methodology, but those are issues of weight. The trial judge, as the finder of fact, weighed the testimony, found it compelling. And this court cannot reweigh those findings under a competent substantial evidence review. Also, the question of what constitutes a parent tract under the Jarrett case is also for the finder of fact. If, and uh, once again, if, if you wanted to challenge the methodology for coming up with the, that parent tract, the, um, the across the fence methodology, which the record establishes is actually a well-established appraisal methodology. And I, I believe that Mr. Sparks testified that he'd never seen any appraiser use any other kind of methodology when appraising these common areas in large subdivisions, these, 
these subdivisions, these common areas aren't available for sale on the market. So the typical valuation approaches that, that appraisers would use really don't apply. But a cross defense methodology is used to, to value these common areas. And, and that's what he did. Um, I, I feel like the case is pretty straightforward. There, Mr. Brigham did touch upon a possible tension between the new Daubert st standard and the, if you accept the Armadillo dissent's view of Armadillo, which I don't believe that, that the majority has ever embraced, but the Armadillo dissent's view of, of the arm, rule of Armadillo would be a, a loosening of the standards for expert testimony. Presumably that tension, if there is one between Daubert and Armadillo would go something like the trial court would find, well, under Armadillo, the appraiser's testimony would be admissible, but under Daubert, the testimony would not be admissible. Um, if that's the case, I don't believe that this case would be an appropriate vehicle to explore that tension because again, Mr. Sparks' testimony was never tested under Daubert. And so we, we simply don't know because Tidewater declined to, uh, to raise a Daubert challenge. We simply don't know whether Mr. Sparks' testimony would have been admissible under the Daubert standard. Of course, this is all done before a, a, a judge. Like if one had been made, I suppose the judge could have in, uh, considered Daubert in the context of the, the issue that was, was before him or her. At a minimum, the appellant would have had to object to testimony to preserve the issue. And there, was no, there were no objections raised. If there's no questions, I ask the court to affirm. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Mr. Brigham, five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I think I'll uh, hit some points that I think are very important in terms of defending my clients. Um, Dalbert is a straw man. Uh, for 30 years, I've done eminent domain representing property owners. A 74.051 order of taking hearing I don't waive because uh, evidence is admitted the ability to challenge the validity of an appraisal, which is uh, one of the statutory prerequisites for the department to be able to have the eminent domain uh, power and use it. And, and this idea that an owner waives their defense against the taking on the validity of the good, good faith estimate of value of that appraisal, uh, I, I believe is a, is, a, is a straw person and it should be put aside. Um, this, this is a very important element in eminent domain. This is a eminent domain is a mixed question of law and fact here. What constitutes the parent track? And when looking at Justice Barquette's decision on the Supreme Court and Jyrick, who cited favorably the third DCA's uh, eight factors consideration of the use unity, please understand the court is making a decision as a matter of law that uh, that appraisal, that valuation was no good because uh, it, it in that case, uh, did not consider lots separately under a presumption that they were subdivided. Your honors, please understand this is very important policy to protect property rights. If the department or other condom nor can come in and define the taking as being just the little bit of common area that they're taking and then make the argument, uh, it's not plausible. The across the fence methodology is used in corridor valuation. In evidence, there are appraisal treatises that properly identify you use that methodology only when you're not trying to value severance damages on either side of the corridor. That is so clear. This is an, uh, an issue of the combination of defining and abbreviating the parent track to the point that there is no remainder, so there are no severance damages. So severance damages are categorically excluded. And then using an appraisal methodology that does the same, this is a perfect case to be able to say, the Florida legislature meant what it said that when you negotiate in good faith, you have to have a valid appraisal. If the department had done that in 2017, we would be on the tracks and we would have had an opportunity to negotiate for a buffer wall, as opposed to now having to fight in the valuation trial uh, where we go in for damages 
uh, because that's not part of the construction. And your honors, I would just say, if, if we're looking at strictly construing the statute, if we're trying to protect property rights, uh, as, as this court and Florida courts have done, this is a very important case that the court should look and not buy into this, there's nothing to see here. You know, if the department can do partial takings of these little pieces and then not uh, give the owner an appraisal of severance damages, that's in direct contravention with the exact language of what the court said, in, I'm sorry, what the legislature said in 73.015 pre-suit negotiations, not just a payment for the property taken, but also damages to the remainder property. So I asked the court to uh, pause, look at uh, exhibits A, B, and C, which are the descriptions of the taking and the pictures. Um, those are strong facts. Judge Sniffen, a very good judge below, he did hear all the evidence. He weighed it. He made a decision. But we say that it's an error. He did not, as a matter of law, invalidate an appraisal that he should have. Uh, he is a very good jurist, but he needs direction from the appellate court to determine that when an appraisal is invalid, yes, uh, it matters at the order of taking. Yes, it matters when these written offers are made. And it's not something that the owner should have to fix later in the valuation trial. You know, I'm arguing against a benefit-based fee. I want the department to treat people fairly from the very get-go and make a written offer based on a valid appraisal. That, that helps us preserve people's property rights because this is a matter that should not have been litigated. The department should not have used this methodology. And if this court moves this opinion aside, PCA, there won't be any discretion uh, applied to the use of the ATF method, the cross the fence method, or abbreviating parent tracks. This case is on everybody's radar. And I would just ask the court to give that uh, a, a very strong consideration in making your decision. And we thank you for uh, your review. We thank you that uh, we have this opportunity to come and bring this matter uh, before you. Um, I, this may be one of the uh, most attended Zoom uh, arguments that you have this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brigham. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Our next case on the docket this morning is De Silva versus Deutsche Bank. Judge LaRose, Mr. Ackley needs to turn on his camera and mic. Okay. And that does make a difference. Mr. Ackley, good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. Okay. Uh, do you want any rebuttal time, Mr. Ackley? May it please the court, Your Honor. I would reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Very well. We're ready to go when you are. Um, I am here today representing Marcos K. De Silva and William Comtois, uh, homeowners in Lee County, and we are appealing a lower judgment, a lower court judgment in favor of Deutsche Bank National Trust Company as trustee in trust for the registered certificate holders of First Franklin Mortgage Loan Trust 2006 FF8 Asset Back Certificates Series 2006 FF8. The First issue I bring before the court is that on November 10th, 2009, um, Deutsche Bank uh, MERS as nominee for First Franklin, a division of National City Bank of Indiana, the um, endorsee of the note in this case, 
assigned to Deutsche Bank National Trust Company as trustee for FFMLT Trust 2006-FF13, Mortgage Pass-Through Certificates Series 2006-FF13, the mortgage and, and the note that are in uh, at issue in this case. That was the first and only assignment of mortgage of this mo note and mortgage before the court, below and here. The uh, evidence uh, was entered into evidence as defendant's exhibit number one, as a uh, certificate, certif certified copy of assignment of mortgage. It's in the record at page 286 through 287. And I would ask the court to pay particular attention to the language of that assignment of mortgage. Um, it includes the language uh, unto the assignee, uh, together with all monies now owing or that may hereafter become due and owing uh, in respect thereof and full benefit of all powers and all of the covenants and provisions therein contained and said assignor hereby grants and conveys unto the said assignee the assignor's beneficial interest under the mortgage to have and to hold the said mortgage and note and also the said property unto the said assignee forever subject to the terms contained in the said mortgage and note. That's at page 287 of the record, and it's dated November 10th. That assignment of mortgage was recorded on March 12th, 2010. And again, that assigned everything to the trust with the series numbers 2006-FF13. Let me circle back, Mr. Ackley, and I know I think your position is you're taking the position that the trustee didn't have standing, but let me look, if you look at the record, Deutsche Bank is in fact the holder of the note. You do, you, would you agree to that or you, I, you still dispute that? I would dispute that in to, the, to, the, to the extent that they are in possession of the note purportedly, but that doesn't mean they're the holder. If you look at Florida statute, and that's if, if Florida statute 673 applies or chapter 673 applies, we have to look at 673 30 to one for the specific terms under which somebody becomes a holder in due course. In other words, entitled to enforce, equitably entitled to enforce the note. In that yeah, case, I, there has and to I, and, and I understand that, Mr. Hyde, but here also we need to look at what's been presented below. It wasn't there also further evidence that at least Deutsche Bank did enter a Bailey letter, a trial showing the original note that was sent to its counsel before filing suit. And that That's reflects the possession. Record. I'm sorry, Your Honor. That okay. reflects possession. I agree. Yes, absolutely. Okay. There's a Bailey letter. We're not contesting that. We're not contesting that. And they proffered a copy of the original note. And eventually the original note was referenced and it was present in the lower court. However, again, it was Deutsche Bank FF uh, for series 2006-FF08, not Deutsche Bank series 2006-FF13. So they have something that is self, self-serving and it's not in any way reflective of any alteration or change to the assignment of mortgage that was issued in 2009. In fact, and I would cite to the seminal case that people refer to with this, the mistaken uh, paraphrase, the mortgage follows the note. Well, that's true to an extent, but not entirely. Even, even Ortiz and um, McLean versus JP Morgan Chase uh, Bank, they, they require it to be the holder. And in, in, the, in, in the Ortiz case, uh, as in McLean, it's filed absent evidence to the contrary. There's a presumption. But in this case, there is evidence to the contrary. We have the only assignment of mortgage before this court is an assignment of mortgage executed in 2009, recorded in 2010, which concretely shows a transfer of both the note and the mortgage to a different entity not the entity that's before the court. And there's nothing before the court to challenge that. There is no evidence whatsoever to show that that wasn't a valid assignment. But if I may, Mr. Asher, I guess it goes back, doesn't the fact that someone is a holder in the note, once you have a holder note, someone has standing then to foreclose. Would you agree with that proposition? If you I, wouldn't. I wouldn't, and here's why. When one refers to Florida Statute 673-3011, 
we find out that a person entitled to enforce the instrument, and the plaintiff has referred to this themselves, the appellee has referred to this themselves, that gives standing to enforce the note, not to foreclose. And there's a huge distinction here. And the distinction falls upon the language, a person may be a person entitled to enforce the instrument. And yes, we're not arguing with that. Even though the person is not the owner of the instrument or is in wrongful possession of the instrument. And there's the distinction. There's the rub. The fact of the matter is, if they're in wrongful possession, um, or they're not the owner and they're, they're in wrongful possession, that doesn't provide equitable title. There has to be an indication, a, a, an exchange of, of consideration. There has to be a, 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 an exchange for value for an equitable transfer to take place. Absent that equitable title, absent that equitable transfer, uh, the mortgage can't follow the note for purposes of, uh, uh, of foreclosure. The entitlement to enforce the note, that's a different matter. And there may, in fact, be entitlement to enforce the note, but that's not the cause of action that was brought before the court. They're trying to foreclose. They have no right to have the note. They're in wrongful possession. And they're trying to foreclose and take away a house using a mortgage that can't be enforced because they don't have equitable right to do so. That's the key distinction. And I would say that, and I would point out to McLean, ALS, um, HSBC Bank versus uh, versus Bousset, all of those cases still rely on the fact that there has to have been a valid holder in due course, not an inequitable uh, possessor, which is what they're effectively arguing. Because we possess the note, we can enforce it. Well, that's 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 not true. And I mean, the common argument to that effect is the uh, the the FedEx or the UPS person delivering the note certainly doesn't have right to enforce the note, uh, even though they're possessing the note. Um, but the people who have possession of the note are before the court arguing that they have the right to foreclose are doing so without showing the court any ownership, any transfer of value, any consideration. Uh, in other words, no right whatsoever to enforce this note to foreclose. They may have the right to ent uh, enforce for entitl uh, or entitlement to enforce for a debt, but they have no right to foreclose because they have, no they have not shown the court any equitable ownership or equitable rights whatsoever. That's the first argument. The second argument is entirely different. And in this argument, we would argue that chapter 673 doesn't apply at all. We would argue that since this note has been transferred to a, a, a REMIC, a real estate mortgage investment conduit, the note was certificated. And this argument was made at length in the lower court. Um, and uh, it, it was pointed out that this is a REMIC. The testimony was that it's a REMIC. Um, as a REMIC, the, the note has been certificated. In other words, it's been cashed. It's like cashing a check on your phone. Yeah, Mr. What? Ackley, I, I was I, I was fascinated when I read that in the brief, and I, I'm trying to find out what authoritative Florida law there is that that recognizes that I've basically taken a note and I've turned it into a security, and uh, sort of like the the debt sort of disappears. Well, the debt doesn't disappear. Uh, I, I understand your, your 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 point, Your Honor. I would argue that chapter six seven eight and six seven nine apply. Uh, six seven eight, um, ten thirty one, I believe, is the 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 section of six seven eight. It even specifies that once the note is secured, six seven three does not apply. The terms of six seven eight apply and six seven nine apply. Because once it's certificated, what effectively happens is the trust is committing the cash flow from the notes that are put into the trust to certificates, their investments. Isn't that, isn't, isn't that, that, but that's a relationship between the trust and the, the beneficiaries. I, I don't know how that impacts it, the obligation of the mortgagor. Because the, the certificate holders have already paid for the note. They've paid the trust for the note. It's just like cashing the check. One, I, nothing changes physically on the check, but the check has been cashed. The monies have been transferred from one bank to my bank, and that note or that that check can't be cashed again. The note can't be cashed again. It's already been cashed. So the, the has it been has it been cashed, or of the the beneficiaries of this trust, they're basically buying into a cash flow of a the, of a packet a packet of notes that have been. Uh, taken on by the trustee. Yes, that's exactly right. But those cash flows aren't from one note directly to one certificate holder. The cash flow is put into a pool and, and, and broken up into the different derivatives and the certificates are invested in those different derivatives. It, so in other but words- But all, all those mortgagors 
remain liable because if, if, you, if you just put them out of the picture, the cash flow stops. But the mortgage and isn't the in the trust. is going to be very upset. No, uh, the mortgage isn't in the trust. The debt is. Well, now, the originator can, can still enforce the debt. It's just that you don't have a mortgage certifying. It can't, it can't cert, uh, uh, secure the notes anymore because they've been added to the trust. They've been pooled. And once they're pulled, they can't be, they can't, they're, they're not fungible anymore. Not, they're not individual. Mr. Um, Ackley, if, if I may, because like Judge Lewis, I'm intrigued. Do you have any cases that support your position? I have these. Any cases at all? <laughs> because that's, quite frankly, I think it's a novel argument. It's an interesting argument, but is there any legal authority that you could point us to that we could we've review? Been trying- We've been trying to get Florida courts to understand the UCC function and how UCC's chapter eight and nine changed the nature of the note for a while. I don't have the case law in, in Florida at this point. I do have bankruptcy law that I can provide the court later, supplemental law, that where the bankruptcy courts have clearly held that this certification, the certificate uh, nature of the notes has, has altered the nature of the notes, but I don't have Florida court law. Uh, it would be a novel issue for this court. All right. <laughs> The next issue that I really do want to bring before the court, however, is the limited power of attorney relied upon by SPS to bring this lawsuit on behalf of Deutsche Bank National Trust. Um, And that can be found at page 224 of the record. Um, That limited power of attorney, Your Honor, let me just pull it up. Um, There are there are four distinct issues that create problems for the plaintiff and should have precluded judgment for the plaintiff in the court below. The first is that the limited power of attorney is incomplete. Um, the limited power of attorney is dependent on language and terms that are that are uh, articulated within the service agreement, the pooling and service agree- agreement. Specifically, on page 228, there is reference under Exhibit A, there's reference to a pooling and servicing agreement for the Asset Back Certificate Series 2006-FF8, the, the so-called plaintiff in this case, or the party that it purports to be the plaintiff. The problem is that, it, that certif- those agreements, uh, service agreements, are incorporated, the, the language and the requirements, the duties and obligations are incorporated as part of the um, the power of limited power of attorney. In fact, the language on page 224 reads, that know all men by these presents at Deutsche Bank, et cetera, uh, pursuant to agreements listed on exhibit A, the one I've just referenced to attached here too, hereby constitutes and appoints the, the Select Portfolio Servicing Inc. Uh, by and through, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in connection with all mortgage loans serviced by the service pursuant to the agreements. Without the terms of those pooling and service, the, the pooling and servicing agreement, we don't know what the rights and obligations are to the extent of the agreement that's articulated in this power of attorney. Well, let's, let's, let's see if I could talk a little bit about that, Mr. Ackley, as I'm looking at it here. Okay, the actual authority itself, doesn't the, the, the power of attorney expressly authorize SPS to perform acts and execute documents in the name of the trustee for purposes, including foreclosures? Would you agree with that? I wouldn't. And here's why. When you go to page or paragraph eight on page 225, um, the language of paragraph eight is pretty specific. With respect to a mortgage or deed of trust, the foreclosure, the taking of a deed in lieu of foreclosure, or the completion of a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure or termination, cancellation, or rescission of any foreclosure, including without limitation, any and all of the following acts. And then it articulates um, six specific acts that the power of attorney uh, conveys duties on the servicer to carry out, none of which is the foreclosure itself. Um, and that's a key issue. They're not authorized to bring the foreclosure. They're authorized to- Mr. Uh, Ackley, may I interrupt you for a moment? You, you are into your rebuttal time, but uh, use your time as you wish. Thank you, Judge. Um, then, so those, I would argue those six arguments, uh, those two, those six elements do not convey foreclosure as an act that the the plaintiff is entitled to do. The last issue I really do want to highlight is that SPS has brought this, has verified the complaint and brought this in the name of Deutsche Bank uh, Series FF2006-FF08. However, on page 226 of the power of attorney, there is this specific language. Nothing contained herein shall limit in any manner any indemnification prior 
uh, provided by the servicer to the trustee under the agreement or be construed to grant the servicer the power to initiate or defend any suit litigation or proceeding in the name of Deutsche Bank National Trust Company, except as specifically provided for here. And, and there's nothing specifically provided for in this power of attorney that allows them to bring this lawsuit. They've argued that they're doing so as an agent and they're authorized to do so, but that flies in the face of common sense. If they're if the language of their power of attorney specifically states they cannot be bring this lawsuit in the name of Deutsche Bank National Trust Company, which is exactly what they've done, uh, they're precluded from doing so. Um, and with that being said, Your Honor, I respectfully request the court to reverse the lower court's judgment in favor of the appellee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ackley. You'll have about three and a half minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Ms. Morat? Yes. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honors. Allison Morat for the appellee. Um, like many foreclosure appeals, the main issue here is standing. Uh, the appellants have failed to meet their burden on appeal to demonstrate error. There is enough evidence in the record to uphold the judgment. The note is endorsed in blank. It was attached to the complaint. It was filed with the court and plaintiff produced a Bailey letter at trial. This is enough under this court's decision in Mink and Engle. Um, but the more interesting issue is that the note is a negotiable instrument. Um, it meets the definition of a negotiable instrument under 673-1041. The appellants have not cited any authority to show that the negotiability of the note was destroyed. Um, rather, there is one case in Florida that's directly on point, and that's the Bousset opinion out of the third district, and it deals with this very argument. And the third district said that promissory notes, such as the one at issue in this case, are negotiable instruments. Um, plaintiff is the holder of the note. It had possession of the no note, and that is enough to enforce the note and foreclose. And that's under but 670. This, but Mr. Ackley's argument, as I understand it, is that the, the, uh, the assignment was to series eight, and the party bringing the suit is the trustee of series 13. So is, is that a gap that needs to be bridged to establish standing? No, Your Honor. <clears throat> the plaintiff that filed suit is Deutsche Bank as trustee, um, trustee for the FF8 trust. There is an assignment that is Deutsche, to Deutsche Bank as trustee for FF13 trust. Um, that doesn't matter. The assignment is superfluous. It's irrelevant to plaintiff's status as the holder of the note. There are a number of cases in Florida that speak to that issue as well. Um, the assignment doesn't convey possession of the note to be the holder. Um, it, logically, when you look at the assignment, it's it's logically a Scrivener's error, the, the digit um, FF13 trust. There was a loan modification executed prior to the assignment that is con conveyed in favor of Deutsche Bank as trustee for FF8 trust, which is the plaintiff in this case. The assignment comes after that. Um, given the volume of these foreclosures, there was probably a Scrivener's error but the assignment does not matter. Was that, was that explained to the trial court? Or the, the possibility or the actuality of a Scrivener's error? I don't think that there was testimony that there was a Scrivener's error, but I don't think that that matters either because the case law says, even if there's a conflicting or a confusing assignment of mortgage, even without explanation, it does not destroy the plaintiff's status as the holder of the note. Um, the cases on that are ALS v. Garvin from the fourth DCA. We've cited that in our answer brief. Also, there's cases that say that plaintiff does not have to prove the identity of the trust. The trustee doesn't have to prove on whose behalf it, it acts, and that's the Ginsburg opinion from the fourth DCA, as well as the Harris opinion. So the, the, the plaintiff is Deutsche Bank as trustee. The identity of the trust, whoever's receiving the cash flow from this does not matter for the purposes of standing and to be the holder of the promissory note. So my comment to Mr. Ackley, you'd agree that because Deutsche Bank is in fact the holder of the note, it has the standing, it has standing to foreclose, 
particularly also, like you said before, it entered a Bailey letter at trial showing the original note was sent to counsel prior to trial. So our analysis focuses on that, that whoever is the holder of the note does have the authority or the standing to foreclose. Yes, Your Honor. That is what, that's what our argument is, is the focus is on who has possession of this blank endorsed note, not whether or not there's an assignment out there that has um, a, a wrong trust series in it. How many foreclosure appeals do you see where there's an issue with an assignment of mortgage? There are numerous. Um, and the case law fortunately says that these assignments are irrelevant to the plaintiff's status as holder. I also want to point out that the appellants did not cite to any specific provision of the UCC or chapter 678 or 679 in their briefs. Um, Mr. Ackley mentioned 673-1031, but that specific statute is not cited in the brief. It's not explained in the brief why that statute destroys negotiability of the note. So the argument's not materialized. There's, there's nothing here for the court to accept this novel argument that's being presented. But if you really want to go and look at that statute and drill down into it, I think that you would see that a negotiable instrument is still a negotiable instrument under 673 if it's held in a securities account. So even these statues that are vaguely referenced in the brief do not take this note outside of Article 3. It's still a negotiable instrument. The note and the mortgage don't disappear with the securitization process. And practically speaking, if that type of holding would halt um, the transfer of commerce and these notes and mortgages across the industry. So it, it, would, it would be a cat catastrophic result. Are there any other questions on the assignment of mortgage or negotiability? Yeah, I, the last issue addressed by Mr. Ackley is the power of attorney that was produced as evidence in this case. And the power of attorney is a complete document. If you look at it, it references the servicing agreements, but it doesn't purport to attach those agreements as exhibits. So the power of attorney is a complete document. Um, second, the appellants don't have any challenge, or any standing to challenge plaintiff's compliance with the servicing agreement or the servicer's compliance with the servicing agreement. They're irrelevant to the true issues in this foreclosure case. Um, third thing is the, the power of attorney specifically allows the loan servicer SPS to do things in Deutsch's name, including foreclosure. Mr. Ackley referenced paragraph eight, and that references foreclosure. It also includes language, including without limitation, the following acts. And the use of the words, including without limitation, those aren't words of restriction. Those are words of enlargement. And if you look at the Black's Law Dictionary, it says that including without limitation denotes a partial list. It doesn't mean that SPS can only do the following things. So that argument is really a non-starter. Um, and finally, the power of attorney is valid. The valid power of attorney is complete. It was properly put in evidence, but here we produced a witness at trial with knowledge of the servicing relationship. She said, I'm an employee of the servicer. The SPS is the servicer for plaintiff. She had personal knowledge of this. We didn't even need the power of attorney to prove that relationship. It wasn't a necessary component. It doesn't destroy, even if you say the power of attorney is defective, it doesn't destroy this case. The court should still affirm. I think that I've addressed all the issues that were presented by Mr. Ackley. And if the court has any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Moran. Thank you. Mr. Ackley, three and a half minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, with regard to uh, the requested sites with 
uh, relating to the securitization of the notes. I would cite the court to Chadburn v. Park, 571 U.S. 377. It's a U.S. Supreme Court case that shows that there's no private right of action by the investors. Um, and this speaks directly to the fact that the certificate holders are basically bondholders. They have no right to go after the debtors to the trust. Uh, it would be like uh, somebody who uh, bought a share of stock in Apple going after uh, a company that's a debtor to Apple. Um, and that's not how it works. They're not allowed to do that. With regard to the assignment of mortgage, I'd cite the court to the transcript, um, page 91, where uh, the plaintiff's own witness has testified, uh, the question to the witness by myself was, what trust does that indicate the loan was assigned to? It says Deutsche Bank National Trust Company as trustee for FFMLT Trust 2006-FF13 Mortgage Pass-Through Certificates Series 2006-FF13. Uh, an entirely different trust than the one you just a minute ago testified that this loan was in, correct? Correct. In fact, the assignment of mortgage actually retrodates the assignment, doesn't it, to a prior date. It says effective June 1, 2006, the assignment of mortgage um, and then the next question was, we don't have a corrective assignment here today, do we? No. Your Honor, there was nothing. There's no, no competing evidence. There's no concrete evidence, whatever, that contradicts the fact that this note and mortgage, they both were assigned to FF13, not to the plaintiff, which was FF08. Um, this is not a Scrivener's error. If there was a Scrivener's error, there should have been a corrective uh, assignment of mortgage or something to contradict the fact that the trust FF13 has this note and mortgage. The um, section of the statute cited by counsel was uh, not 673-1031, but rather 678-1031. Um, and to suggest that the trust doesn't matter is uh, just disingenuous. The trust, the plaintiff uh, uh, purports to be Deutsche Bank as trustee for a specific trust, not here in its own name, but as trustee for that trust. That's who's before the court and the trust is fundamental. And lastly, counsel has suggested that to allow us to follow UCC chapters eight and nine would be catastrophic to the industry. That's just nonsensical. The debts exist. The trusts have been created in a specific manner in order to allow for the cash flows of the notes to be uh, pooled and sold, uh, investment sold as derivatives, the debt still exists and there's still a right of action or entitlement to enforce those debts. It's just they can't be foreclosed on. So that's that's the issue here. And th this is a trade-off that the uh, trusts have made in order to get tax-free uh, 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 status within the IRS. Um, and again, your honors, I would ask the court to please uh, uh, review this case and find for uh, my, clients and, uh, my clients and reverse the lower court's judgment in favor of the plaintiff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ackley. Thank you both. Thank we'll you. move on to our third case on the docket, which is uh, Fannie Mae versus Doherty. Mr. Wasilek and Mr. Rosenberg are both here. Mr. Rosenberg, would you like to reserve uh, some rebuttal time? Yes, Your Honor. Five minutes for rebuttal, please. That'll be fine. We're ready to go whenever you are, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. I represent the appellant, Federal National Mortgage Association, in this appeal. There are several issues I'd like to discuss here today. If this court has no immediate questions, the first issue I'd like to proceed to is our sufficiency of the evidence claim. Now, we are challenging the sufficiency of the evidence behind the trial court's ruling that Fannie Mae failed to prove who owned the property at trial and failed to prove that it named that person as a party, as a defendant in the case. Now, under this court's decision in Colson, a sufficiency of the evidence claim is reviewed for competent substantial evidence. Mr. Under this court. Can I can I just kind of cut to the chase, if I may? You're taking the position here, as I review your brief, that your that that the suit was brought against the individual, the son. Okay, and he was only named. And what was attached actually is the actual note that was signed by his parents. 
and and let me go one step further that you're taking the position that there was a stipulation that he's the owner the owner of the property and because there's that stipulation which the court did not accept you believe that there was error in the court granting the he used the word directed verdict but basically granted the dismissal of this case in a nutshell that's your position correct in a nutshell yes okay. Okay, which then leads me then to the, was there anything that Fannie Mae did in this case to tie in the fact that, let's just assume that stipulation comes in. Yes, he owns a property. Is there anything was presented by questioning or anything that it, the note that was attached by his parent, that he took it, he owns a property, but he took it subject to the note or he... To, he had some interest for this prop, anything to tie that in in order for, 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 to, to have that kind of um, uh, be in the record to support your position. Yes, Your Honor. Well, that was the stipulation. So we alleged in our complaint, and the complaint was judicially noticed by the trial court at the trial. We alleged okay, in our no, complaint. No, okay, let me stop you there. Because mm -hmm. as I understand the record, and correct me if I'm wrong, I thought that there was a request to take judicial notice of the complaint and then the complaint that indicates that the, the son, you know, owned the, pro uh, uh, owned the property. But I thought the court here said, I'm not going to take judicial notice of a complaint. A complaint is a complaint. And so the question for me, has there been any request of the trial court or to push him further about to accept the stipulation that the son was in fact an, the owner of the property and he took ownership of the property subject to the note, subject to any that he has interest, something that will give the bank the opportunity to go after him. Anything to, to link that bridge. Yes, Your Honor. Well, the, the trial court did accept, did take judicial notice of the complaint. And it said it wasn't going to take judicial notice. And this is on page 337 of the supplemental record. It said it was going to take judicial notice of the complaints, but it wasn't taking judicial notice of the fact that Doggerty owned the property. It was going to require additional evidence of it. So we have the complaint in evidence. And obviously Fannie Mae, the, the, a trial was decided on the pleadings before it. So the pleadings before it were Fannie Mae's complaint, which was judicially noticed. But in any event, that was, that was Fannie Mae's complaints, right? We in said your, that Doggerty. In, in one of your in one of your other pleas, maybe as a response to uh, to reply to the answer. I mean, you denied uh, certain defenses related to the what I guess were the deceased parents. So I don't know how you can have a stipulation when your your pleading is contrary to that. If your honor is referring to the reply to affirmative defenses, we denied their affirmative defenses. Correct but we never denied that Doggerty owned the property. We always stood by our complaint and the allegation that Doggerty owned the property. We never amended our complaint and he never raised as an affirmative defense, this indispensable party argument. But, that but was not- Another thing that troubles me though is you, you took a position in your pleading and as best I can tell the fellow sitting in the courtroom and you don't call him. And I, 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 I get the impression that what the judge was concerned was that you're just relying on your pleadings and, and this is an evidentiary hearing. Call the fellow, and get that link that you need. Well, Your Honor, so a, a couple of things here, right? This is, this is undisputed, uncontested, that Doggerty is the owner of the property, right? So we're presenting our prima facie case, and this is important. We're not, this is not defendant's case, this is our case. So we only have to satisfy the elements to, to, to prove our foreclosure claim. An indispensable party, that a person is an indispensable party, that is an affirmative defense. This is uncontested. We say that in our initial brief. They say in their answer brief. We repeat it in the reply brief. This is an affirmative defense. So we are not obligated to present evidence on this. We're not obligated to disprove an affirmative defense in our prima facie case. We just but have to. Have, but don't you have, Mr. Rizzo, an obligation to show that he does have some interest in the property? And when you mentioned about 
if you look at the pleadings, it's kind of interesting. His answer in the firm defenses, he basically said, yeah, I'm an owner of some property. He didn't admit in a way that he owned this particular property. I think it was kind of coy on property in the county, which then circles back, to, I guess, to what Judge LaRose is saying, what I was saying earlier. Is there anything to link, anything to show? Because a pleading is a pleading. But as, as Judge LaRose said, you're now in trial. You're there to prove these, you know, the, the allegations and the complaint. And you have a judge who's rejecting a stipulation that he's the owner. And so this is where I'm kind of, help me out, help me to understand, you know, if, if that in fact happened at, at trial. Well, Your Honor, and you know, this is related to our due process argument as well. So we're raising this under sufficiency of the evidence claim, right? So we're saying that an appellate court reviews sufficiency of the evidence for substantial evidence. We're saying the trial court's finding that didn't have any evidence before it as to who the property owner was is not supported by the record. So let's look at the record. We have our complaint, which is judicially noticed. Fine. It, you know, whether or not Fannie Mae took any other arguments or steps at trial, let's just put that aside for a second. That is before the court. We have Dougherty's repeated admissions in open court to the trial court that he owned the property. And this is what he says. Your Honor, in this matter, the borrowers are deceased. Mr. Dougherty is their son. He is a fee simple owner of the property. So you That's have the that lawyer admission. saying that, right? That's the lawyer saying that. Correct, Your Honor. And under, under Dykus from the 5th DCA, Hullab from the 5th DCA, Vogel, Curry from the 4th, quote, a party is bound by factual concessions made by that party's attorney before a judge in a legal proceeding. This is an admission. In an, ev in an, in an evidentiary hearing where proof of your claims must be made? Those cases stand for that proposition? I mean, this is this is our prima facie case, right? And if say if he say if he gets up before the trial court and he says, yeah, I agree that I've no I've agreed that they're entitled to foreclosure. I agree that I defaulted. If this is his counsel saying this. My client agrees to all these allegations. I stand aside. Are we required to present evidence on those uncontested facts? And what the courts have said is no. You're required to accept the trial court's factual concessions, admissions. And an admission can occur during trial. It doesn't have to occur in an answer, which was coyly worded, as Your Honor noted. An admission can occur during a trial. And the, that's that's a rule of civil procedure 1.190B, which we cite in our brief. So an admission can happen during trial. And that is exactly what happened here. He admitted the allegation in our complaint at trial. He said to the trial court, I own the property. He said this repeatedly. And so what we're saying is there is no evidence before the trial court that supports its finding that we didn't name the property owner. This is, a, and I recognize our, our counsel is a bit blindsided by this issue, which is a due process concern. So I phrased my arguments carefully on appeal. And our first argument is sufficiency of the evidence claim because we can raise that for the first time on appeal. And our argument is, and this court reviews, is there evidence supporting the trial court's finding that we failed to prove who the property owner was, that it didn't have evidence regarding who the property owner was. So this court looks at what was before the trial court when it made that ruling. Is there something in the record that supports its finding? And what you have is the complaint judicially noticed, but just put that aside, you have defendant's admissions. And he says, his counsel says, they named us as a defendant, they named us as the property owner, we admit it, we admit it. And he says that repeatedly. So that's what the trial court is confronted with. And, and again, this is the sufficiency of the evidence claim because I recognize we didn't make all the appropriate arguments at trial. We didn't do that because we weren't on notice that this was going to be an issue. Again, this is an affirmative defense. We don't normally have to prove this in our prima facie case. This is not something that we're normally prepared to prove. If the, and that is pursuant to case law from this court and others, which talks about the element for a foreclosure case. If this is an additional element that we now have to prove going forward, it would be helpful for an opinion to, to note that because right now the case law does not say that we have to prove that we named all indispensable parties in our prima facie case. In fact, the rules of civil procedure say that indispensable parties is an affirmative defense. And my colleague admits this in his answer brief. He says it's an affirmative defense. We do not have to, this is Custer from the Florida Supreme Court, we do not have to disprove affirmative defenses. So we get up there, we stand by our pleadings, we make our case, we say we're entitled to foreclosure, we satisfy all the elements. And then Doggerty says, yeah, I, I admit that I own the property. And he says this repeatedly. And the trial court rejects that stipulation. And the trial court says, no, I'm going to require additional evidence of it. And I'd just like to transition, if this court doesn't mind, since I'm running up on my, my 15 minutes here, 
instead that due process argument here. Uh, Judge Kuzem, I cited extensively in the brief, your decision in D. Giovanni, and that is central to, to our, our argument here. And I don't want to get, if this court disagrees with the sufficiency of the evidence argument, that's fine because we have an equally compelling argument regarding due process. Judge Kuzem and D. Giovanni, you wrote a trial court, quote, must not independently investigate facts in a case and quote, cannot seek the production of evidence that the parties themselves never sought to present. That is exactly what happened here. We did not, nobody raised this issue of if we named it as well parties. Nobody was raising this issue. It was the trial court who injected that into the proceedings by rejecting the stipulation, by saying that I need to see other evidence that Doggerty owns the property. D. Giovanni says you cannot do this because that, that gives the appearance of partiality, whether the court is partial or not is beside the point. It gives the appearance of partiality. That alone is reversible error. It is a due process violation. And I don't raise due process concerns lightly, but D. Giovanni is exactly on point. Second, Mr. Mr. Rosenberg? Yes, Your Honor. Well, let me ask you a question. Suppose the parents, suppose parents aren't dead. Suppose they're living in the house and suppose the son comes in and says, yeah, I'm the owner, and the foreclosure proceeds and a foreclosure judgment is entered. Is, isn't there a problem with that? Uh, two responses to that, Your Honor. First, it was uncontested below that they are deceased. Doggery well, said it. No, well, but it, I think what the trial court was concerned with is we have this guy who's being sued by the bank and the guy is saying, oh yeah, I, I own the property. Yeah, yeah, it's mine. But but as, as Judge Kuzam was saying, where where is the link? Where is anything to show that this guy actually owns the property? What if, what if somebody is still actually living in the house and you're just entering this foreclosure judgment against the property and there's, there's nothing before the trial court to make it clear that this is actually the right person who's being named it wouldn't be an indispensable party argument necessarily. I mean, it would, but not in the way, more in the way I think Mr. Waslick has framed it than in the sense that you're framing it. So wouldn't that be a problem? Well, Your, Your Honor, I, I mean, it, so if they are owners of the property, then they're indispensable parties under case law from this court. So th that is their defense to make, and they can make that by a motion to vacate but under 1.5. But if they're, but if the actual owners of the property aren't the ones being sued, I mean, who's supposed to make that defense for them? I think then is, that would, is that's a due process problem right there, right? That, well, I mean, it, it is if the party raises it, right? I mean, we don't know. It's not our burden to disprove. Do we have to prove that there are no other owners besides Doggery? Uh, this is not part of our prima facie case. Now, don't you have to prove that you're suing the right person? We have to name them in the complaint, and then it's up to them to say if they're the wrong person or not. That's why. <laughs> why is it up to them? I mean, what do they care if, if it's not? If, and if they don't really own the property, you're you're going to depend on that person to the, defend the interests of somebody else. I, I think the point is that rights are are articulated by parties. It is the party's obligation to to make these arguments. And uh, Doggerty was certainly welcome to present a case and say, you failed to, to name my parents as indispensable no, parties. I think, I'm think, I think you're missing my point. I think my point is sort of, if let's say, I don't know who, let's say Bank of America files a foreclosure action on my house, but they, but named Judge Kuzam as the defendant. And she says, yeah, yeah, sure. I own that house. Absolutely. I mean, she's not going to say, oh, you know, no, it's it's judge. I, I have to depend on her to, to say, no, you know, you may want to say something to judge Joachim about this. I mean, I maybe I have no idea this is going on. Wasn't the court concerned that there was nothing to show that the person that you sued was actually the right party to the action, the right defendant to be sued? I do understand your honor's point. And I, I, my response is that you look at the case law, Liberty Home Equity versus Ralston. We said that in our initial brief, page 22 to 23, it lays out what you have to do to establish a prima facie case for foreclosure. And it has four elements, an agreement between the parties, a default by defendant, acceleration of the debt to maturity amounts to. Those are the four elements. That is what we relied on. That is the case law. I am not aware, and my colleague did not cite any case law that requires us to prove that we named the right party 
and that you know maybe I this Michael the, Smith is the, the problem here, Mr. Owen, is is the pleading itself attaches a note that does not name the actual person that you sued, and I think that's that's the key. So everything that you're saying about what the requirements are, the cases you're spot on. But in this case, if you look at what's been provided to the court, the actual complaint, you have a named defendant. And what's attached is a note of other people. And that's where the issue, I think, becomes problematic in this case. Mr. Rosenberg, yes. excuse me for interrupting you, but you're well into your rebuttal time. I know we've been peppering you. So you're at about yes. three and a half minutes, but uh, do as you wish I'll with your time. Yes, Your Honor. I'll just, I just want to quickly respond to that before you move on to my colleague. So my, my point here is that it is up to the parties to make these arguments. That is what this court said in D. Giovanni. That, and, and if this court wants to clarify D. Giovanni, but that's what we, I'm relying on. A trial court cannot independently investigate facts in a case and cannot seek the production of evidence that the parties themselves never sought to present. That is exactly what happened here. Parties can make whatever arguments they want, if someone finds out their house is being foreclosed on they can, and they weren't named, they can file a motion to vacate. It happens, unfortunately, sometimes. There are remedies available to the parties, but the, the court is not uh, the court should not be put in a role where it is, it is sui sponte raising things that nobody ever raised before at trial for the first time when we're obviously unprepared to deal with this sui sponte issue. Nobody had raised this before. A case is decided on the pleadings, not by sui sponte questioning by the trial court at trial for the first time. I'll reserve the rest for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. We'll give, I'll, I'll give you three minutes on rebuttal, okay? Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Wasilek, we're ready when you are. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, and may it please the court. My name is Michael Wasilek. I'm here on behalf of the appellee, Michael Doherty. And um, I, I imagine that you'll have some questions for me as well, especially since you know I was trial counsel, as you can tell from the record. But uh, I'd like to start with the due process issue first, since that is kind of the one that's, uh, that, that counsel spent some time on. And I find it remarkable that the plaintiff uh, below and the appellant here has indicated that there's a due process violation being blindsided by a defense that is expressly mentioned in the rule to be reserved at trial. 1.140H2 expressly says there's a handful of defenses one of which is failure to join an indispensable party that may be made at trial despite uh, uh, prior pleading uh, presence. It's not waived by failure to raise an emotion, not waived by uh, not it being included in the pleading. And so it is incumbent on every plaintiff to be aware of and be prepared to meet those arguments. If I had moved, for example, to dismiss the complaint for failure to state a cause of action at trial, uh, the case law is abundantly clear that I can do so at any point in trial on that. Uh, and regardless of whether it's been raised before, and it's plaintiff's burden to be prepared to meet that. Uh, the same with the uh, notion of an indispensable party being omitted. Because the rule expressly reserves that for trial without waiving it, if it's not raised prior, it is something that can be raised. And I believe the reason for that uh, is because we have to see what the evidence shows at trial. And that is the other key point of what happened here, is that Council talks about sufficiency of the evidence and couches this as an affirmative defense. And I agree that it's an affirmative defense. But the question that is before this court is, first of all, did the trial court apply the correct rule? And secondly, did it have sufficient factual basis, evidentiary basis to rule the way it did? And the rule, I believe, is clear that on a motion for failure to join, on a motion to dismiss for failure to join an indispensable party, if the evidence shows that an indispensable party has been omitted, the trial court should grant that. And in a foreclosure action, uh, if there is evidence that the owner, an owner, any owner of the property has been omitted, the trial court should grant that motion. And here, the undisputed evidence, the testimony of Mr. Neal, was that the owners of the property were the borrowers. And the court can certainly read the transcript and infer uh, whether or not anyone was surprised by that. But ultimately, once that evidence comes out, and it's, by the way, no redirect, you know, no calling of Mr. Doherty to ask him whether or not his parents were still alive or had an interest. And we can speculate what his testimony might be. I certainly have some speculation what he might have said, but they just didn't do that. And so what we're faced with is now that Fannie Mae is 
trying to use the appellate procedure in order uh, as a vehicle to correct the tactical errors of its counsel. And perhaps those tactical errors can be explained by the fact that Fannie Mae's trial counsel may not have expected that argument, may not have expected that testimony. But the problem is, is that it's incumbent upon the plaintiff in a trial to anticipate and prepare for such arguments. And in this case, where you have a situation where the borrowers on a mortgage are not named as defendants at all. And in fact, there's no mention of them in the complaint. Uh, Let's just assume this, Mr. Ross. Let's just assume if they if they were named in the complaint, and then if at trial there's been a, a stipulation that your, your client owns the property, we'd be in a different position altogether because then at that point, the, you know, if there's a, a stipulation as to I own the property and if all the parties have been properly been, been, been sued and everybody is before the court, you don't dispute the fact that a court that if both sides agree or stipulate to 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 a determine to ownership that the court at that point would be bound to accept that stipulation under that limited fact in that alternate universe i would agree uh in, in this case we don't have that stipulation um and i would point to the transcripts uh, at the beginning of the trial where the where the trial court asked uh the parties if there were any agreements and that's at uh, the record, uh, supplemental record 314, which is page four of the trial transcript, lines 15 through 18. The trial court says, are there any agreements of the parties? And, you know, counsel for defense, that was me, as the first to answer, no, there's none. And uh, Mr. Barsky, who is the trial, uh, who is trial counsel for plaintiff, also agreed. There were no agreements that needed to be brought before the court's attention. So at that point, at the beginning of trial, there's no agreements. And throughout the course of the trial, there's no agreements that are that are resolved. And certainly, most importantly, there's no agreements proffered or considered about what, if any, interest John and Geraldine Doherty, the parents, the borrowers, may have had at that point in time. And again, we can speculate what Mr. Doherty's testimony would be. We can speculate what might have been if in a different universe, but if there had been a stipulation offered and accepted, and there was a meeting of the minds, and we talk about that a little bit in our brief, if we agreed on a specific fact that was stipulated, that would be different. And the, the characterization of a stipulation about Michael's interest, I would point out one additional time that imagine if, you know, again, we're, we may be talking about an alternate universe here because the undisputed evidence before the court was that John and Geraldine were the owners, but in a universe where Michael, John, and Geraldine had joint interest, omission of any one of those three would have been sufficient to sustain a motion for involuntary dismissal based on the failure to name an indispensable party. Uh, and it, Mr. Neal's testimony in this case, the trial witness, went once he said, they're the owners, and that testimony was not equivocal. Um, and, you know, the subsequent testimony about whether or not they were, they had passed away was equivocal. But the important thing is, is the trial court is permitted to accept that testimony in the absence of any stipulation or uh, in the absence of any meeting of minds in the pleadings. Because, you know, as, you know, Judge Kazam pointed out, um, you know, we were very careful to admit those facts we wanted to admit that we knew were true, and we were careful not to admit facts that we didn't have actual knowledge of. And so, and, and also importantly, the reply by Fannie Mae, there's a lot of confusion, I think, among, the, uh, among lots of lawyers about what a reply does. A reply or the absence of a reply is a de facto denial of every fact in the affirmative defenses. And so, uh, we do have that denial in the pleadings. We don't have a meeting of minds in the pleadings. Had they said anything in the pleadings, John and Geraldine are now deceased, we would have been required to assert an answer, a response to that fact. Uh, we were, they did not, and we did not. Um, and that, in that alternative universe, we might have a different set of facts. But here, what we have is the pleadings don't address the issue squarely, or to the extent that they do, there's a, there's a dispute. We get to trial. There's no stipulation as to whether John and Geraldine have any interest in the property. There's no meeting of the minds on that fact. And so it goes then to the evidence. And the evidence is the, un, the, the uncontradicted testimony of, of Calvin Neal is that John and Geraldine own the property. And 
I'm sure the trial judge was curious why there was no attempt to, to redirect or call Mr. Doherty as a witness to explain what the fact pattern might have been or why he was asserting that ownership and why, you know, through his trial counsel, he was making an unsworn assertion of counsel. But, um, but certainly, you know, we, we, at that point, the trial judge is faced with what is the testimony? What evidence do I have? And based on that evidence, can I, should I dismiss the case? Um, so the, the, the idea that there's a sufficiency of evidence problem here is a red herring because the sufficiency of evidence, uh, because we agree it's an affirmative defense, it is incumbent upon us in the trial court to determine, does the evidence support a dismissal of that defense? In this case, it did. I didn't need to do anything. I didn't need to call any additional evidence. I cross-examined their witness. Their witness made a statement that supported that motion. And so, uh, you know, defense could have rested and still... Uh, it would have been proper for dismissal on that fact. So unless there's any specific questions, uh, we would ask that the decision of the trial court uh, be affirmed. Um, I suspect this may be ripe for, a, for a, uh, an affirmance without opinion, but uh, certainly if the court is interested in writing on that, I, I think it would be appropriate. Um, I, I, I want I to I just briefly, briefly touch on the D. Giovanni case, because as, as the court is familiar, uh, you know, I, I have some knowledge of that case as well. And the issue here is that the trial court didn't do independent investigation and didn't rule on an issue that the parties didn't seek to present. The cross-examination was the defense presenting that part of the case, presenting the evidence to support the motion. And the motion itself was the motion. Um, the trial court did not do any independent investigation. The D. Giovanni case involves conduct that is much different from what we have here. This is the trial court indicating, I have a question about what the parties are going to prove. And that statement doesn't come close to crossing the line that D. Giovanni did, where the trial judge left the courtroom, did independent research by pulling up the internet and obtaining documents on a computer, and then making a factual finding based on those documents. That is a completely different situation than what we have here. And, um, and so the D. Giovanni case is completely irrelevant. Um, you know, assertions are not admissions. And so, uh, you know, in this case, we just have, we have a record where the trial court is entitled to believe the trial, the, the witness testimony of Mr. Neal and is entitled to rule the way it did on based on that testimony. So if there are no questions, I'm going to go ahead and, and simply ask for this court to affirm the trial court's decision below. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wasilek. Thank you, Arms. Mr. Rosenberg, three minutes or three and a half minutes, I guess. Thank you, Your Honor. So I, I want to just bring a couple of short, simple points to this court's attention. First, it's undisputed, and my colleague says it repeatedly in his brief and now just at oral argument, that the argument he made below is an affirmative defense. He says that just now, he said it below. So I just want to keep that in mind. It is undisputed that the argument upon which the trial court granted dismissal or judgment is an affirmative defense, and that that, would, that happened during our prima facie case. So just Judge Rothstein, you came with respect to your question. Uh, these are a couple of questions I would just post to the court. Is proving who owns the property and that we named all the property owners, which it's undisputed that is an affirmative defense, is that part of her prima facie case? I said case law saying it is not. And there are four elements. That is not one of the elements. If there is new, are new elements that are to be added to a foreclosure cause of action, it would be helpful to have case law explaining that because right now the case law from all of the DCAs is consistent. That is not one of the elements. Also, under this court's decisions in Haas, uh, on a motion for involuntary dismissal made at the close of plaintiff's case in a non-jury trial, a trial court is limited to determining whether or not the plaintiff has made a prima facie case. So the trial court is only supposed to look at, have we presented proof on those four elements? That is it. Uh, my colleague makes much of the fact that we didn't present evidence in who owned the property. We didn't because it's not part of a prima facie case. Plaintiffs are not currently proceeding to trial prepared to prove the nuances of, of title and ownership of every single defendant because that's not part of our prima facie case. So with that said, admitted that this is an affirmative defense and, and by implication that is not part of our prima facie case, the question I want to ask is, uh, is this an issue that a trial court can raise to a sponte and why? Can you, for instance, if we move for summary judgment, can a trial court raise this issue to a sponte and summary judgment if we move for default judgment? Let me, let me, let me interrupt you, Mr. Rickers. It, it troubles me and I think you totally... I don't think you understood the questioning that we're asking you. 
your client bears the burden to prove that they're entitled to foreclose on this specific property. And what did your client choose to do is to attach a note to the complaint that your client that that you choose to do, and the note basically says somebody else owns the property. You named a defendant that's not named in that note. So the obligation remains that you have to prove that you sued the correct defendant and you that bears your proof. So the four elements you're saying, that goes to the very beginning of the element where you, that bears the burden that you have to show because you chose to attach that note. You chose to attach that note that shows other people own the property. So what the judge did in this case, he has all that in front of him. You bear the burden and the judge goes, wait a minute, are you gonna prove? Are you going to prove? Are you going to show something? Are you going to show me anything? So I want to make it clear because I wrote the opinion, Giovanni, that was very different from the facts in this case. And I think Mr. Wasilek indicated that this is a judge going outside the record completely. So I don't want you to think that we're creating new law or we're trying to create an added burden, but it goes back to the core. What is the responsibility of your client in this case. So I just wanted to say that because I think you're missing, missing our, our, our point. Yes, John, I realize I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, and so I would just have to ask that this court reverse the reasons in our brief and the reasons expressed at oral argument. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you both. We are going to take uh, a 15 minute break before we address our last two cases on the docket.
We're back. And the next case on our docket is Baden versus Baden. Sir, we can't see you. There we go. Mr. Crave, good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. There's Mr. Mellish, so I guess we are all here. Mr. Mellish, how much rebuttal time would you like? Five minutes, Your Honor. Very well. We are ready when you are. Yes, sir. My name is Blake Melhewish. I represent the appellant in this case, Christopher Baden. The genesis of this appeal is an order of force enforcing a settlement agreement. Now, this was an oral settlement agreement entered onto the record in the trial court. It was transcribed and incorporated into a final judgment later uh, issued by the court. Central to a determination of this appeal are two issues. What does the agreement encompass and who is bound by the agreement and hence the final judgment? The trial court's order effectively resolved two other cases that are not before this court. Mayaka Energy, which is one of the, one of the uh, other parties had brought two cases to recover monies from Virginia Baden and Joanna Baden on seven promissory notes in the amount of $119,000. The trial court indicated that the notes were part of the settlement agreement and therefore they were discharged. If we take a look at the settlement agreement, the language and the terms of it, they simply do not support this finding. In short, Mayaka Energy never released or discharged Virginia or Joanna Baden from the notes. Mayaka Energy is a separate legal entity. It is 99% owned by a trust, Baden Irrevocable Trust, that was established by the party's parents in December of 2012. At the time of the settlement agreement, Robert Melsom was the trustee of the trust. He was also the only managing member of Mayaka Energy. There are eight beneficiaries in this trust. There are the three children, Virginia, Chris, and Joanna Baden, and their five children. So clearly, Mayaka Energy and the notes are trust assets. So the question is, can the agreement be interpreted or construed to include the discharge of those notes? And if so, what was required in order for the trial court to do that. Mr. Mellowish? Yes, ma'am. Let, let me inter interrupt you here. Could Ray, Ray, Ray Baden have brought suit on behalf of Mayaka Energy? No, he could not. The trustee was the, was the only person that could bring suit. He was the only manager of the corporation or the LLC at the time. Okay, and that who, in, in these other two cases that are currently pending, um, who, was that suit brought by Chris? And I apologize for using first names, but there are a lot of Badens floating around. So was, yes, was that, did Chris bring that on behalf of Mayaka Energy as the the one, the, the party with, I guess, the majority interest or? or? No, uh, Mayaka Energy brought those cases in its own name. Okay, so Chris had nothing to do with the filing of those cases? Mr. Mr. Chris was the was the managing member of the LLC, but as far as the entity bringing the suit, that was Mayaka Energy Group. Okay, so Chris Chris has agreed to indemnify uh, Jody and Virginia in that suit, correct? By virtue no, of the settlement agreement. No, ma'am. If we take a look at the settlement agreement, it begins on sixty one seventy of the record. And it continues on to 6171. And what the record indicates, I said one other thing regarding Paul Masola is that Paul Masola and Chris Baden would indemnify and hold Virginia and Jody Baden harmless 
from any claims from Ray Baden or Mayaka Energy Group regarding the loans that are owed by Palma Solar Development to those individuals. And the court said, say that part again. I said, Palma Sola and Chris Baden would identify Virginia and Joanna Baden against any claims or causes of action from Ray Baden and Mayaka Energy Group. So this was said in the context of Mayaka Energy being a creditor of Palma Sola. We then went on to further, further explain that to the judge both Mr. Levine and uh, myself explained it to the judge, and we were clearly speaking about identification on the Palma Sola debt that was owed to Mayaka Energy. So if Mayaka Energy decided that they were going to sue Palma Sola on the debt, and since Palma Sola had been rendered insolvent by the actions of Joanna and Virginia Baden, at least those were the allegations, they could be held personally liable on those notes. So it, it, it was not a blanket identification from Chris Baden or Palma Sola on anything having to do with Mayaka Energy. It was only as a creditor of Palma Sola that the, the identification proceeded. Mr. Bilsch, can I just jump in? It appears that this judge was the same judge who basically oversaw to the hearing on the actual, uh, to use the word, the global settlement. We're dealing with the same judge, correct? It was the yes, same one? Yes, uh, because I, uh, the transcript has been provided as part of the record as well. And in reading through the transcript where the court went in and uh, questioned everyone to make sure about this uh, settlement, at least in looking at the transcript, it appeared to be that it includes everyone, it includes everything, everything. So help me out as to why is this not a global settlement that includes everything? Well, Your Honor, global is a, is a term that's defined by the terms of the settlement agreement. The settlement agreement defines the universe within what we're going to term global. And if we look at the very beginning of this case, or the very beginning of the transcript at 6162, I state on line 21 through 24 that all cases pending between the parties would be dismissed. There are currently two cases and we go in to identify the cases. Then we go to 6169, and again, on line 14, I say the idea here, Your Honor, is anything pending between the parties and involving the parties is going to be dismissed. We then go back to the discussions that uh, the court had with the parties. Now, these discussions were only with, and again, I apologize for using first names, but with Chris, Virginia, and Joanna. They didn't have no discussions with the trust. The trust is a separate legal entity uh, Mayaka Energy is a separate legal entity, and then you have the beneficiaries of that trust. They're obviously separate. So by saying that this is anything, it didn't have anything to do with the trust, Mayaka Energy Group, or uh, the trust beneficiaries. The only mention of the of Mayaka Energy Group is on 671 or 6170 where there's an identification right for, for them being a creditor of Palma Sola. So it included everything that went between these parties and that included four causes of action, one appeal and two petitions for writs that had previously been filed. So we ended up dismissing five or six different cases. Some of those had different defendants in it Two of the cases, Virginia and Joanna Baden, were the plaintiffs in. One against Mr. Levine, Chris Baden was the plaintiff in that. And Virginia and Joanna Baden were the plaintiffs in all the other cases. So those issues had been, were, were intended to be resolved, the issues that were in those cases. None of those cases involved a, an effort to collect on the note. And if we go back and we look at the transcript of those settlement discussions, the notes aren't mentioned. They aren't mentioned in there at all. There's no mention that 
Mayaka Energy has released any of those notes. There's no mention that they have waived any of those notes. And by their motion to enforce the settlement agreements, the plaintiffs, are, are Virginia and Joanna Baden, made it painfully clear that they knew about these notes. And if they wanted to be released, they wanted those discussed, then all they had to do was bring it up because they obviously knew about it. They didn't bring it up. And it's not otherwise mentioned in here. And Mayaka Energy Group is not mentioned in anything other than the context of the identification for, uh, by Palma Sola and Mr. Baden uh, on a debt that's owed back to Mayaka Energy, not the note, the individual notes that Virginia and Joanna Baden signed over to Mayaka Energy Group. So it would clearly be easy enough for them to do that. And the trial court. And, and you don't think, Mr. Marshall, I'm looking, and this is a statement that you've made there that uh, you mentioned about Palmasola, is that Palmasola would in, and Chris Bitt would indemnify and hold harm, hold Jody and Virginia Harmless from any and all claims from Ray Baden or Mayaka Energy Group regarding the loans that are owed to those individuals. And then later on, when you said that, you said it again for any that Palmasoa and Chris Baden would indemnify Virginia Baden and Jody Baden against any claims or causes of action from Ray Baden or Mayaka Energy Group. You don't think that's broad enough to include all this? I do not, Your Honor, because we need to read the agreement all together. So we need to have the predicate to that, which is my comments to the judge about what the agreement was. And he said, say that part again, so I do. And the court says, what do you mean by the word indemnify? Mr. Levine explains it, I explain that. And then Mr. Levine actually gives an example where Mr. Ray Baden would sue Palmasola for the 131 that he was owed and that he would, or the uh, Virginia and Joanna Baden would thereby be indemnified from that debt. So that whole provision needs to be read as a whole without trying to segregate out uh, you know, one particular statement from the other. So the qualifying paragraph is my comments about what we're going to indemnify them against. And so your limitation is the that are owed by Palma Sola development to those individuals. And, and the point is that the seven promissory notes have nothing to do with Palma Sola. That is correct, Your Honor. And, and I guess that was my question because later on, Mr. Levine said, because we're assigning all our rights, all our rights, so everything has already been you know, assigned. And so it's all settled. Let's all move on. And that's why I'm having difficulty, Mr. Mellish, and understanding why are those pieces carved out? Why wasn't that spelled out at this saying, well, yes, we have the settlement. However, we still have this remaining. If we, if we take a look at that colloquy, Mr. Levine says, let me explain it. So if Ray Baden decides, though he's beyond the statute of limitations, he wants to sue Palma Sola for the 131, because we're assigning all of our rights, we have no right, we have no right to defend it. Palma Sola is in a position, and so is Chris to tell his father, we've settled, let's move on. We don't have Ray Baden here to say that. So again, we're qualifying this to Palma Sola. And the fact that because at the end of the day, neither Virginia Baden nor Joanna Baden would have any rights in Palma Sola, that it would be up to Palma Sola and Chris Baden to defend any suits by Mr. Ray Baden or Mayaka Energy Group against Palma Sola and potentially against them. And, and, and I appreciate that, Mr. Mills, but why didn't you then at that point when they're talking about the whole thing to say, you know what, Judge, however, there's these two loans out there and this settlement doesn't include that. Why wasn't that brought that out at the settlement hearing? So that makes sure that everybody is aware, making sure because everybody's referring us to a global, global settlement. So help me out. Why wasn't that mentioned at that point in time? Okay. This goes a little bit off the record, Your Honor, 
but I was not the attorney of record in all of these related cases. And the promissory well, note- And just make it clear, I don't want you to go off the record. I'm making reference to this when you were the attorney here, if the intention that this was not a full settlement of any and all claims, wouldn't you have brought this out to the court and say, we have all the parties here. The judge went through painstaking to make sure everybody understood and to say, oh, by the way, this is not an, there's still a couple of things out there. I'm not privy to it. I'm, I'm not involved in that, but there's a couple of things out there. Why not bring that out at this settlement hearing? Well, first of all, I wasn't privy to these other proceedings by and between the parties. And secondly, we were concerned with Palmasola at the time and dismissing these related actions, none of which had anything to do with the promissory notes that Mayaka Energy sued Virginia and Joanna Baden on. So this agreement was not intended to be an agree agreement to settle anything between the parties, but tr the trust, Mayaka Energy, and the trust beneficiaries were not parties to this agreement. They just simply weren't parties. They, and there was no legal authority for either Chris Baden, Virginia Baden, or Joanna Baden to affect the rights of those parties. In other words, they couldn't come in and say, hey, we waive any rights we have you know, to collect on these debts on behalf of Mayaka Energy. They were not the main. Excuse me for interrupting you, sir, but you are at your rebuttal time. So use your time as you wish. I just wanted to remind you. I'll just finish this comment and, and pass the baton. The, these are separate entities, and those debts are owed to those separate entities. None of the parties to this action could affect or could legally affect any of that. So mm -hmm. in order to do that, then you know those people would need to be had had to be come in to this action in order to uh, bind them to that. And that's so, why Chris I agreed to indemnify rather than waive, right? Because he didn't have any authority to waive. Well, he didn't have any authority to waive what Malacca Energy would do on the loan that Paul Masola owed to it, which is what we were discussing in in that colloquy here. I will pass the baton. Okay, very good, sir. You'll have uh, four minutes on rebuttal. Thank you. Mr. Grave. Yes, thank you. May it please the court, uh, Heather DeGrave on behalf of the appellees, Virginia Baden and Joanna Baden. And as I'm sure your honors have noticed, uh, Joanna Baden is often referred to as Jody Baden uh, in the record. This court should affirm the trial court's order granting the motion to enforce the, the final order approving settlement agreement. It is clear from the transcript of the July uh, 25th, 2019 hearing that all persons who could bind Mayaka Energy Group were present and that all persons uh, present agreed that all claims that comprised the long and contentious Baden family saga, including any claims of Mayaka Energy Group were to be forever mutually, generally, and finally released. As Judge Nicholas said at the hearing on the motion to enforce in September of 2020, given the deep-seated animosity here, which was so evident to the court, and at this point, um, the, the uh, Judge Nicholas is not only at this September 30th hearing, but he's also had presided over a four-day trial in the case below, uh, which was so evident to the court. I took great pains to make sure that all parties understood the nature and extent of the global settlement agreement, particularly the expansive and all encompassing nature of that agreement. I felt an obligation to make sure that everybody understood what they were getting and what they were giving up and make sure that everybody understood that everything was over. The appeals were over, the multiple cases were over, the multiple issues were over. The settlement was global as the court stated on the record multiple times in the July 25th, uh, 2019 hearing. The facts are that the appellees, Virginia Baden and Joanna Baden gave up valuable consideration in exchange for this global settlement. Before the settlement, appellees, along with appellant Chris Baden, each owned 30% of the Baden Trust. And the Baden Trust owned 99% of Mayaka Energy Group. And it owned the lodge in Mayaka, Florida. 
They each owned one third of the shares in Palmasola Development. They each owned 30% of the shares of Saray Inc., which owned the acreage in Mayaca, Florida, that with the lodge was known as the Rocky Creek Ranch. Now, Mr. Meluish uh, said that the promissory notes had nothing to do with uh, the trust, with, with anything being settled that day. But when you look at the, the notes, they're directly tied to the sale of Health, Care Health Park East, which was uh, owned by Palmasola Development, and the, um, and the acreage, the Rocky Creek Ranch acreage. They're directly tied to those sales, the sales of the Baden Trust assets, the, sales of Palm, uh, the sale of the assets of Palmasola. So to say that they were not part of this, of course, they were part of this global settlement agreement. Did Palmasola specifically uh, owe any debts to Mayaka Energy? Not, not, not Joanna and Virginia in relation to Palmasola, but did the entity Palmasola itself owe any debts to Mayaka Energy? Uh, I believe that there may have been a claim uh, that they did. Um, I think that there was dispute about whether there, that was a valid claim. But yes, I, I do think that there were those claims. But, um, but when you look at the nature of, of what's going on here, um, this was, uh, there was a lot to unwind. And the court intentionally made sure that, it, that everyone understood that it was all being unwound and resolved at that July 25th, 2019 hearing. Uh, the um, appellees had pending claims at, as of July 25th, 2019. They had pending claims against the appellant, um, the former trustee of the Baden Trust, and the former receiver. And the appellees gave up all of that in exchange for this global settlement. So that after the settlement, the appellees owned nothing, but as important, they owed nothing. That was the exchange. The appellees would not have given up their interest and their share and control of the Baden Trust and by extension, Mayaka Energy Group, just to turn around and be sued by Mayaka, Group, Mayaka Energy Group. That makes no sense. The only reasonable understanding of this settlement is that it was in fact a global settlement agreement. The trial court understood that to be the case. The appellees understood that to be the case. Robert Melsom, who was uh, present through his attorney, uh, understood that to be the case. Everyone understood that to be the case. Even appellant and his counsel who is here today understood that to be the case, which makes their Mayaka Energy Group lawsuits and this appeal knowingly without merit. Mr. Grave, remind me of the Mayaka structure. There, there's one managing member Yes, um, at the uh, the in terms of the uh, ownership of the share of the interest in the company, it was owned um, ninety nine percent hmm. by the Baden Trust. Um, okay. But in terms of the management, um, at the time July twenty fifth, twenty nineteen, uh, it, the trustee Robert Melsom was the um, was the managing member. Um, after he was discharged, subsequent to this settlement, um, because the, the settlement, you know, uh, you know put all that to an end, gave, gave the control to appellant Chris Baden, and then appellant Chris Baden became the managing member of Mayaka Energy Group. Okay, so the, 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 the prior trustee was not at this hearing, but his counsel was there. Right, um, yeah, Mr. Melsom, who was at the time trustee, he was present through the appearance of his counsel, um, Caitlin Jamo, who sat through the entire hearing, um, didn't make any objection to any of the settlement agreement terms that were that were being announced, um, e except to preserve her right to recover her and her clients' uh, you know fees and costs. So uh, I, th is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong. This sort of the bottom line to this is Chris understood that that Chris. The point was that Chris would say, enough, we're done, right? That's why he agreed to indemnify if uh, Ray brought suit. That's why he agreed to indemnify Mayaka Energy, um, whether it's in a limited context or not. This was Chris saying, I'm done, this war is over. And now with these other two suits, the problem, if I understand it correctly, is not so much that Mayaka Energy is a separate entity that wasn't technically bound or was bound, but that Chris is driving this train. 
And Chris understood that this was all supposed to end. And so to the extent Chris has the power to direct what's going on, he agreed under that settlement agreement that he was going to be the adult in the room and he was going to say enough. And does that, does that pretty much sum up your position? Your Honor, uh, yes, I agree entirely. And I think that when you look at that, um, at that ex explanation of, um, of what he's going to do with respect to the indemnification, first of all, there is the, the one statement that um, was unequivocal that um, Thomas Sola and Chris Baden would indemnify Virginia Baden and Jody Baden against any claims or causes of action from Ray Baden or Mayaka Energy Group. Now, then the explanation further specifically refers to the Palmasola, but but what you see when you when you are looking at this explanation is is that the, the parties who were present at the hearing were recognizing that that there were other people who were not present at the hearing who may make claims. And as your honor said, Chris Baden was saying, listen, I am going to put a stop to that. I am going to say we settled. We're we're done. Let's all move on. And yet instead of moving on, he broke his promise only months later and directed his attorney, Mr. Meluish, to file suit against Virginia and Jody Baden on behalf of Mayaka Energy Group. All persons who could bind Mayaka Energy Group were present, as we mentioned. Robert Melsom was present through his attorney. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Baden was present himself. Uh, and was put under oath and questioned about whether he agreed to this. And yes, 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 I agree to this. Mr. Meluish was present at that hearing, was in fact the person who announced most of the terms of the agreement. By appearing, they all consented to the jurisdiction of the trial court to enforce the settlement agreement that was entered into on, on that day. And they all agreed that the settlement agreement would resolve not only the case below, but also all litigation pending in the circuit court including all cases related to the trust or related to receivership assets. Those assets included the 99% interest in Mayaka Energy Group and, the, and therefore the assets of Mayaka Energy Group. So appellant's argument that the trial court had no jurisdiction or authority to settle, dispose of, or deal with trust or receivership assets is simply without merit. The trial court, yes. Currently as it stands, is there any who has the authority to bring suit on behalf of Mayaka Energy? Well, um, I currently, uh, Mayaka Energy Group is managed by the appellant, Chris Baden. Okay, so he's the only one who could say, we're, we're gonna sue. Yes, okay. as we sit here today, yes, I believe that to be. Okay. And so the trial court saw through appellant's ruse and properly entered its order enforcing the settlement agreement and confirming that a release of the promissory notes was included within the global settlement agreement. The trial court did not err in its interpretation of the global settlement agreement. There was no abuse of discretion in the trial court's conclusion that Mayaka Energy Group and the promissory notes were included in the agreement. And appellant and his counsel knew or should have known that there was no basis in fact or law for appellant to break his promise to indemnify and hold appellees harmless to file the 2020 cases on the promissory notes or to file this appeal. Therefore, this court should affirm the order granting appellees motion to enforce settlement agreement. And this court should award appellees their fees and costs for enforcing the settlement agreement and for responding to this baseless appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttal. Yes, sir. I want to address these in, in kind of reverse order. First of all, uh, Appley's counsel said that only Chris Baden could authorize suit, but at the time of the settlement agreement, the only person that could authorize suit on behalf of Mayaka Energy would have been Robert Melsom. Chris Baden didn't become the successor trustee until February of 2020, almost six months later. There was no indication in the record that he anticipated that happening or that he would undergo those duties. As trustee, he has fiduciary duties to all the other trustees, and that would include the grandchildren that I've identified in the brief as a, as a minority beneficiaries. So we still had fiduciary duties to them. So when we come into all was present who could bind the trust, they were all there, but they didn't do that. So what were they there for? The trust was there because 
they agreed to $100,000 payment as a trust distribution to Virginia Baden and Jody Baden. They also were there to be sure that they didn't breach any of their own fiduciary duties. And the third thing they were there for was to protect the payment of the fees and the attorney's fees and the trustee's fees that were to be made to them. So although they were there, they were not there in the capacity of representing Waaka Energy Group or the trust beneficiaries. They just simply weren't there for that. So the other thing that we need to mention is I believe Appley's counsel mentioned that Mr. Melson was there. Nothing in the record indicates that he was. And on fact, on page 6164, Mr. Levine says, Your Honor, just for the record, I have Caitlin Jamel on the line. She represents Mr. Melson. She, they then went on and the court asked her, all right, do you want to stay on the line, Ms. Jamo? So Mr. Melson was not there. And notably, there was no conversation with either her or Mr. Melson at the end of the case that they understood the settlement terms, like he did with the parties with Chris Baden, Virginia Baden, and uh, Joanna Baden. The next item is global. There is nothing in this agreement that says we're resolving any and all potential claims between the parties. But let's assume arguendo that they did. What they're talking about is claims directly between Chris Baden, Virginia Baden, and Joanna Baden. Not these other third parties out here, the trust, Mayaka Energy Group, or the trust beneficiaries. Because the trust beneficiaries have property rights in those uh, promissory notes as well. And if we look at the promissory notes, the maturity date of those promissory notes was timed with the sale of certain pieces of property. In fact, the last piece of property to be sold by Palmasola Development East, I think it was. So it is mentioned in the promissory notes, but only as a matter to define the maturity dates on that. Now, Your Honor had a question about debts owed to Mayaka Energy Group. There was a debt owed to Mayaka Energy Group. It was $79,000. And it was a loan that Mayaka Energy Group made to Palmasola some years before. And I believe the testimony of the trial court was that was to pay taxes on various pieces of property, but it was $79,000 that Mayaka Energy Group was owed. So if Mayaka Energy Group Robert Melson made that decision as the manager at the time to sue Palmasola to recover that $79,000. That's where the identification rights comes in and that's where it ends. It does not extend to the promissory notes that they individually, that Virginia and Joanna Baden uh, individually executed to the uh, Mac Energy. So there's no indication here that Mr. Melson understood anything other than through his attorney. And there's no indication on the record that he was even present during this. And I'll represent that he wasn't and the record doesn't indicate that he was. Um, You're gonna that, have to wrap it up, sir. I am, I, I am done, Your Honor. I would appreciate if the court would consider overruling the order and sending it back for further proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Our last case on the docket this morning is Judgment Enforcement Solution versus Ganaway and others. Mr. Jackson is with us. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. I see Mr. Weber has joined us as well. Good, uh, good morning, Your Honor, or afternoon. I think we're there. It's close. <laughs> Mr. Jackson, how much rebuttal time would you like? Five minutes, please, sir. That'll be fine. Uh, you may proceed. Thank you. Um, may it please the court. Kevin Jackson here on behalf of the appellant, Judgment Enforcement Solution, Inc., as assignee of Chris Devaney. Um, Your Honors, this is an appeal that's um, from the lower court granting a head of family claim of exemption that was entered in favor of one of the defendants, Mark Stalker, um, as well as the court entered an order granting his motion to dissolve the writ of garnishment. 
Um, we're, we're appealing that, and just as a brief history, there was a final judgment entered against Mr. Stalker for $767,740. Thereafter, the trial court issued a writ of uh, continuing garnishment, um, which was served on Mr. Stalker's employer, Hennessy Construction Services. Now, Hennessy Construction Services is owned jointly by Mr. Stalker, the judgment debtor, and his wife, Catherine Stalker. Um, the writ was served on them. They filed an answer saying that Mr. Stalker makes $140,000 a year. He's paid $2,692 a week. And pursuant to the writ, they're holding about $500 a week. Mr. Stalker then filed a claim of exemption, setting forth that his wages are not permitted to be garnished uh, because he qualifies under Florida Statute 222.11 as the head of family. And if you look at Florida Statute 222.11, um, the disposable earnings of a head of family, which are greater than $700 a week, may not be attached or garnished. That it sounds, Mr. Jackson, that as I read the briefs, uh, what you really need is a legislative fix. Well, no, because what my understanding of what the case law says is the case law says that the court can look at the totality of the circumstances with the idea of the purpose of the statute and the legislative intent of the statute in mind. And I did cite a number of cases um, that stand for that proposition, even the, uh, even the appellee in their uh, answer brief cited to a couple cases, the Supreme Court of Florida case, Wolf v. Commander, and the Fort DCA case, Mozzella versus Bonus. And both of them, uh, every case that's cited by both sides say, look, you have to look to the purpose of the statute. You have to take the facts of each case in, their, in, their, in, in the totality of the circumstances of each case when deciding what to do on these types of situations, when deciding whether a person meets the definition of head of family. And most of them have, with respect to these types of cases, most of them have looked at the term dependency. Now the term dependency isn't defined in the statute. So the courts must look to the facts of the case and other case law in order to determine does this person meet the definition of dependency within the statute? And that's kind of what happened in this case, Your Honor. The court was presented with all of these facts, all of these facts that the, the supposed dependent in this case, Mark Stalker's wife, whether she was a dependent under the statute, whether she was dependent on him to survive, whether she was dependent on him for support. And the case law goes into detail, even the, even the case law cited by the appellees that says, you look at, and, and I'll, I'll read it. Um, the head of family exemption is designed to protect citizens against financial reverses and difficulties and to permit the citizen when residing in Florida and head of family to, to be secure in money coming into him for his labor and his services, thereby supporting his family and preventing them from becoming a public charge. So the I appreciate that, Mr. Jackson, but let's look at the statute itself. And I think okay. it goes back to what Judge LaRose is saying, and it goes back to what Judge Covert was frustrated with, <laughs> you know, because when you think about it, what, this, what does the statute say? And the statute basically says that disposable earnings of head of the family mentioned that is greater than $750 a week may not be attached or garnished. And then he and defines, and here's the key head of the family as, and I quote, any natural person who is providing more than one half of the support for a child or other dependent. So the language is providing more than one half of the support. So going back to the facts of this case, what was the evidence before Judge Covert? It indicated that the wife was only making $10,000 a year. There was evidence presented that he was, he was the one that was providing more than one half of the, of, of the support. So based on the statute, somebody could be mega wealthy, mega wealthy, but if they provide more than, than one half of the support, that's somewhat of a child or a dependent. So, and I appreciate the fact they say what the case law says, but I think I circle back to what Judge LaRose said. This is something that the legislature needs to fix as opposed to us trying to rule against the, 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 the statute or the cases in this case. Well, I think it's, I think it's um, kind of interesting that, that Your Honor kept stopping at um, providing more, more than one half of the support. The, the, the statute or 
no, I read it for a child or other dependent. Right. So, and I think, and I, and I said that, no, no, I've said okay. that I have it right here. Yes. Sir. Sorry. Sorry. So I think we, the, the word dependent is, is, is where this, this is all coming from because no, as, as you get it before, there's really no definite. I mean, there's, is there any case that says what a dependent is? Has there been any definition of a dependent? Yeah, well, no, but the case is in Ray Holland, which is cited in my brief. It's a it's a middle district of Florida bankruptcy case out of Jacksonville. That case had similar facts, and it said the chief dichotomy presented by the parties is whether a showing of support or a showing of dependency is the key factor in proving head of family status. So that court separates the, the support with the dependency. And the court said this court concludes, as the case law demonstrates, that showing actual dependency is the more important factor rather than the mere existence of some financial support. So you have to look at both of those words. You have to look at the word support and you have to look at the word dependency. The courts have said, don't look so much at support, look so much at dependency. Is this person dependent upon this other person? Well, it doesn't matter. Mr. Jackson, what, what if, I think you're sort of changing the wording of, of the statute. You're saying dependent upon as opposed to a dependent of i think i think the word dependent there is used to define the nature of the relationship between the person providing the support and the person who is the beneficiary of that support if you look at the earlier bankruptcy cases a lot of times this issue would come up in the context um if you look at in rivera there was no family because the man and woman were not married and thus the man was not legally or morally obligated to support the woman. And so I think in that context, dependent means someone who is morally or legally entitled to the support. Because as you point out, the purpose of the statute and the, the definition uh, that we're looking to is, is head of family. So whether someone is a dependent defines, uh, defines whether we have a family for purposes of the statute. It's not the person who is dependent upon that support. It is a dependent. And I well, think I think that's where the difference in definition, you, you wanna say it means something different than what the earlier case law indicates it means. Well, I think even the earlier case law sets forth that you can't choose who the head of family is. You can't say, well, you're gonna be head of family and I'm not gonna be head of family. But that's exactly what these people were doing in this case, the defendants. It, it, from 2009 to 2019, they set up their quote unquote family so that Mrs. Stalker was the head of family. All of the bills were paid out of her account. The, the $200,000 purchase price or down payment for the purchase of the company that they owned together was paid from her personal account. The $50,000 down payment for their boat was paid from- you, you, you have to look beyond that. During that time period, don't you have to consider where the, the cash was coming from into that checking account? And again, you have to, my understanding is you have to look at the totality of the circumstances. Well, he, he being Mr. Stalker even admitted that it was set up that way to avoid creditors. He had a, he had a creditor from a, from, as a result of a, I think it was a credit card judgment that came in and garnished his account. And he said, I don't want that to happen again. So I'm going to set everything up in my wife's name so that nobody can do that to me again. That's not the purpose of this statute. The, 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 the case law says you can't use the statute as a, as a, as a sword. You can only use it as a shield. You can't, you can't purposely manipulate your family in order to meet the, 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 the strict, the, the, the strict language of the statute and that's what they're doing and that's what all the case law says you can't do you can't purposely manipulate things in order to fit under here the purpose of the statute is to legitimately prevent people from becoming objects of charity and wards of the state and if you if, if you intentionally manipulate your family as, as the court has pointed out, the family aspect of this argument, if you intentionally manipulate your family to get around this rule, that's not the purpose of the statute. That's not the, the legislative intent of the statute. And that's what these cases say. Is you, you, so you're you saying even if you could fit within the letter of the statute, you're, you're not fitting within the spirit of it. Correct. Then, you're not. Yes, you're not fitting within the, the spirit of it. And, and it goes again to the difference between support and dependency. The spirit of the statute, as, as 
again, all of the case law says is, listen, we don't want this this person who is is making minimum wage to his wages to be garnished, and and now he has to look to the look to the government for support, and he has to feel bad about that. His kids have to get free lunch. He has to he, he loses his his mortgage. He loses his rent. He's out on the street. That's the purpose of the statute. The, the spirit of the statute is that the spirit of the statute is not somebody who has a company that profits a million dollars a year that intentionally manipulates his family structure, intentionally manipulates his bank accounts so that he can attempt to fit under this. So the legitimate creditor that he's that he owes seven hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars can't get to his assets. That's not the spirit of this statute. All right. Um, so just to, just to answer your question. So uh, again, we go back and, and I think that's what some of this case law says is, look, you have to look at the factual circumstances. You have to look at the spirit of the statute. You have to look at the, the purpose of the statute. And the judge, the, the judge in the lower court, Judge Covert even me, says- Mr. Jackson, let me ask you this, because I know you see that you were powerless, or at least you know your client was powerless to show and in and, and, and this kind of context, how much money the husband was making, couldn't you have brought or couldn't your client brought out the fact that, well, maybe some of the profit and taxable income of the Hennessy's is, is, is basically is allocated to the wife in order to prevent her from qualifying as a dependent. There was other methods that you could have at least shown before the court in this case. Sorry, the court The court made a specific finding, and, and, and I'll read it. I said, this is the court talking. It's clear to me that she is college educated, and she's able to work on her own, and she's able to support herself based on the assets that they've accumulated over the years. So that but was that's not, but, but, but the case law, and they said, this is not an imputation of income. Why not? My question is a bit, bit differently. If you're taking the position she should not qualify as a dependent, couldn't you or couldn't your client bring out the fact that, hey, you know, the profit, the taxable income of the corporation is, is basically allocated to her, that we, she's we, getting all that. And we so, Sorry. well, but, but on this record, the only thing that was brought up before the court was the fact that she's only making, you know, and I'm looking at here, 10, let me look at the record here, $10,000, she is, um, she is here we go that uh, uh, she does not have a full-time job she's earning less than five thousand dollars a month um that uh, there's the 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 hennessy corporation cpa and this is what i was driving at testified that the amounts reported as income allocated to the wife were not distributed or available for use so this was an opportunity for you all to kind of attack that or cross-examine that and to kind of break that in order to give the court an, uh, some sort of evidence to say, hey, she does not qualify as a dependent. So that's what I'm driving at, that you had that opportunity and unfortunately it was not there. Well, we, we did do that, Your Honor. And 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 I think the transcript of the, of the, um, the, the two hour, evidentiary hearing that was it was split up into two days but in the two hour evidentiary hearing is attached and on page um page 232 of that record it says that that there's over a hundred sorry over one million dollars in profit made by hennessy construction it's attributed to both of them equally and i don't think it's it's in dispute that, no, and that that's, i'm not i think you misunderstood me all i'm sorry. saying is that the, the what is the comp of substantial evidence the evidence that's presented before the court was that this type of income that was available to the corporation was not distributed or not even available for use by the wife. And so the focus is the wife. Is she a dependent for, under, for purposes of the statute? This is what I'm driving at, not what the corporation has and, 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 and how much money it makes. My question is rather specific as to that. But that, that's my understanding of what, Joe, what what Judge Covert meant when he said she's able to work on her own and she's able to support herself, 
quote, based on the assets that they've accumulated over the years. So she's not depending on, on, on Mr. Stalker for um, her, her support. She's accumulated these assets over the years that allow her to be independent of Mr. Stalker. And that, that goes to um, one of the other cases that, that I cited, the, the, the Beckman case, where the court Mr. said- Jackson, if I may interrupt you for a sure. moment, you're just about- uh, with four minutes left of rebuttal time. So oh, that, went quick, that went quickly. <laughs> it usually does. Use yes. your time as you wish. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I'll, I'll save my, my last four minutes from my rebuttal then. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jackson. May Mr. It please Weber. The, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please Mr. the court. Mr. Weber, could I follow up on something Judge Kuzam raised? I mean, what, what if anything are we to make of the profits that are allocated to the wife uh, for tax purposes? Yeah, so uh, Hennessy was a subchapter S corporation. And as a result of that, its profits flow through but via a K-1 for tax purposes only to the shareholders. And they and are we, the only shareholders, correct? Correct. and and okay. And Mr. Reeder, the CPA, testified that even though they own the entire group of shares as tenants by the entireties and as a moiety, uh, for reporting purposes on federal tax forms, he has to allocate the profit amongst joint tenants. So he gives her a K-1 for 50% and him a K-1 for 50%, but it was clear that that had nothing to do with their rights under state law vis-a-vis -vis the corporation. Which was well, that maybe, jointly, yeah, jointly on the stock. Maybe you can help me out with this. Then, uh, are are her only assets those that come to her through the corporation? Because uh, I'm a little puzzled by the wording of the judge's order. I mean, what what are these other assets that she's accumulated, or are we just talking about the corporate assets? Yeah, I, I don't know what other assets he could possibly be referring to. Mr. Stocker testified that because Hennessy was acquired with a small business administration loan, one of the features of that is that you must pledge your home as security for a small business loan. And so even though there was not an institutional mortgage on their home, the home was pledged as additional collateral to the small business administration. So number one, the idea that they could simply go out and access maybe the home or the equity in the home is not supported by the record. But more importantly, Hennessy Construction is a commercial construction company. And the testimony was undisputed that when they purchased this company from the prior owner, Mr. Alexander, he took all of the equity and cash out of the company and as a result, when Hennessy needed to enter into a new bonding relationship, there were strict covenants that prevented Hennessy's owners, Mark and Catherine Stalker, from withdrawing any profits from the corporation until there was an equity cushion of about three and a half to five million. And of course, as you know, bonding companies and lenders, they never give you anything specific. They say, we'll look at it then as to whether or not we're going to allow you to take profit out. But the testimony was that not only was the K-1 profit that was being distributed to them as income on their K-1s, that had to go to servicing the Small Business Administration debt and building equity in the corporation to satisfy the bonding company. And the testimony was that the if the bonding company, if they made a distribution in violation of those covenants and that bond pulled out, Hennessy would immediately fail because that was essential and critical to its business. And so we cited in our brief, the case of Zold versus Zold, which discusses this income, uh, this pass-through income issue in the context of alimony. And then there it says, that uh, if there are legitimate business reasons for the corporation to retain capital, working capital, then that income is not available to an alimony payer. And for the same reason, in this case, 
it was undisputed that income was not available to either Mark or Catherine Stalker for their support, and that the sole means of family support was $10,000 from a pet sitting business that she had and $140,000 salary from Mr. Stalker. The only restrict, the only uh, uh, provision of those covenants that the corporation was bound by that allowed any money to be distributed was simply an amount sufficient to cover their pass-through tax liability, which is a common uh, trait in closely held subchapter S corporations that because there is phantom income being recognized by the shareholders, uh, the corporation will usually allow enough to cover the tax liability associated with that phantom income. So the stalkers had phantom income, they, they uh, didn't have access to that for their day-to-day -day support. And that is the facts that were presented to the trial court. Other than a boat, which also had a lien on it, I don't know what other assets that Miss Stalker could have possibly accessed to provide for her own support. And so the facts of this case demonstrate that these parties were married 32 years and that Mr. Stalker was the breadwinner now, obviously, during the recession, 2009 time period, uh, construction dried up and he went through some difficult times. And that's partially why we're here, of course. Um, but during that period, Catherine uh, started cleaning uh, and, and working at the Bonaire Hotel in St. Pete Beach for a few years. In 2015, she started the pet sitting business. Now, much is made of this notion that her account was used during this period of time. Um, certainly, once their wages of Mr. Stalker, the statute is clear, subsection three of the statute says, those wages remain exempt once you put them into a bank account. And so the notion that his wages um, you know, were, were being used to defraud creditors during this 10 year period of time, they're simply, incorrect as a matter of law. He can take that those wages and deposit them into account in his mother's name, his wife's name, his own name, and they're exempt from the claims of creditors for six months. And there was no evidence that his weekly paycheck lasted longer than six months. And you so- You could appreciate, Mr. Weber, I mean, you could appreciate Judge Covert's concern. And, and if somebody looks at this, it really doesn't, seem right in a way. I mean, it's legal and what your client did is well within the purview of the law, but it just, my goodness, here's a, a very successful company. And here's, you know, yes, you mentioned about the board and I guess you mentioned there's a lien, but regardless, they have access to this and to quote Judge, Judge Covert, a very expensive boat. It just, it seems unseemly in terms of, 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 of how this came about. But the question for us, it has nothing to do with seemly, whether it's a policy decision. We just need to apply the law as it stands. So it's far different from what we should or it ought to be or, or, or any type of these global policy decisions. And, and, and that's correct, Your Honor. And let's go back to Wolf versus Commander and uh, the Fourth District case. This is not a new issue for courts. In Wolf, Back in the 20s, uh, the, the, the general manager of the Citrus Exchange was making $10,000 a year and was entitled to this exemption, according to the Florida Supreme Court. And the argument was that's scandalous. You know, you could even say people making fifty dollars or $80,000 a year uh, would be entitled to this exemption. And this is really only supposed to protect people who are on the verge of poverty. And the Florida Supreme Court says, there is no cap on what's protected. An executive like the gentleman and, and Mr. Commander, he was entitled to the exemption. And that's recognized again by the fourth district in Mazella saying there's a physician making $100,000 a year and they're entitled to the exemption. And if you don't like that, you can march up to Tallahassee and you can tell them to change the statute. But what is the statute that we look at? All of the disposable earnings over $750 are exempt. There's no cap on that. 
the legislature has had decades to change this had they chosen to do so. So I understand the harshness of exemptions when it comes to, to claiming uh, creditors and, and, and that's something that every lawyer deals with in practice. But the fact of the matter is Florida has a generous exemption when people title things jointly with a spouse, there's no way around that. One a creditor of one spouse can't get to joint assets. That's just a fact of the legal landscape. Similarly, somebody who is the breadwinner and provides the support for their family, it's exempt. Homestead can be very harsh on creditors, but the fact that people are aware of these exemptions and simply provide and take advantage of them is not some kind of evasion of creditors as Judge Covert might suggest. He, he recognized it was his duty, just as the court said in Wolf versus Commander, it is not our job to question the wisdom or folly of the exemption. We're a court and we follow the statute. And that's why he did what he did despite his stated misgivings. Um, I would also note, you know, and, and there was a suggestion in the argument that this was only for minimum wage earners. Again, that's directly contrary to the Florida Supreme Court's opinion and the fourth district's opinion. Um, furthermore, there was a, an automobile allowance of $600 that was raised in connection with this appeal. Um, we argue that uh, an expense reimbursement, uh, a true expense reimbursement is not subject to a continuing writ. And there's cases uh, that we've cited on that. Uh, the Brock versus Westport case says, yeah, this isn't uh, salary or wages, but for the same reason, you're not entitled to a continuing writ for it. So if it's properly categorized as expense reimbursement, as argued, uh, then the court's duty is to still affirm because a continuing writ simply cannot reach an expense reimbursement. We argued in the alternative that if it, the court were to consider it as salary or wages, some kind of an unaccountable a reimbursement program that might be additional compensation, um, then again, it, it would be subject to the exemption. So in either event, the $600 expense reimbursement would either be subject to the exemption or outside the reach of the writ chosen to be pursued in this case. The, uh, the issue here as far as the court standard of review, I think is, is the the, the, the analysis controls. Um, this is a factual determination. The factual finding was made that Ms. Stalker made $10,000 a year and depended on her husband for support. And the testimony was that the electric bill, the utilities, water, sewer, all the household expenses, the property taxes on the home to insure the home, all of that paid for with Mr. Stalker's salary. And I don't know what support looks like, but. Um, just because you may own a home doesn't mean that you can continue to live there forever without paying household bills. And that is what the evidence showed is that Mr. Stalker is the only person paying those household bills and providing for those things through his income that he derived from Hennessy Construction. And I think the finer point taking any of the cases cited by the appellate, if you took Mr. Stalker in his work out of this equation, you would be looking at Ms. Stalker being in poverty. She makes $10,000 a year, which is below the federal poverty level. You have to assume that Hennessy would continue to run without him and that she would just magically go to her mailbox and continue to be uh, supported in the way she was. In fact, we know that if Mr. Stalker were no longer in the equation providing his personal services, Tennessee would not be bondable. And so for all of these reasons, not only a 32 year marriage where Mr. Uh, Stalker provided all of the support, save and accept uh, she, she contributed during that five years she worked at the Bonaire, um, that he was the primary means of support for not only the two of them, they had two children and those children are now in their twenties and they still help them out a little. Um, but, but Mr. Stalker is the head of his family. He has been, it re doesn't matter what uh, account his earnings are deposited into, he is the means of support. 
For these reasons, I would ask that you affirm the trial court's finding. And uh, if you don't have any questions, I will uh, rest on my brief. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes, you may, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, sir. Um, just to kind of expand more on the, on the asset questions that, that the court had and, and uh, the asset questions that Mr. Weber brought up. Um, it, there was testimony that the house, there was no mortgage on the house. There was testimony that they bought this $120,000 boat it was and they put $50,000 $50, down in 2019. So I don't know how much more is left on the boat, but they put almost a half, almost 50% of the boat down. Um, with respect to the bonding company, there was questions asked um, and much was brought up of the bonding company of their requirement. I said, well, what are the requirements for the bonding company? We must keep at least $3 million in our bank account per, per our agreement with the bonding company. I said, okay, so let's, let's say you decide to close up shop, close up your business. Would the bonding company's restrictions hamper you in any way then? They said, no, that we wouldn't have a need for the bonding company because we'd be out of business. I said, well, how much money do you have in your account? They said almost $2 million. I said, so you'd be able to take that $2 million out of your account because you'd have no bonding restrictions at that point. Well, yeah, I guess so. I guess we would. So those are the assets. Those are the type of assets. If they both own the company together, she would be entitled to that money. She would have assets. And to, and to think that she wouldn't have those assets if Mr. Stalker somehow wouldn't, wouldn't perform services for the company anymore, I don't know where counsel's coming up with that, but she'd still have a right to that money. She'd still have the profit to that money. If she wanted to close up that company's shop and take all the money out, she has the right to. That would be $2 million there. She's not going to become a ward of the state. She's not going to become an object of poverty. And, and that's what the, the, the lower court judge was getting at. All of this was presented to the lower court judge. Um, again, the wolf, the wolf versus commander, it sets forth that you're supposed to look at the purpose of it. That case dealt with the definition of personal services in the statute. The, the plaintiff was saying, this person doesn't do manual labor, so that can't be considered personal services. The court said, no, no, no. It doesn't say manual labor. It says personal services. He fits the definition of personal services. That case had nothing to do with showing that the wife had assets. The wife was dependent. That case had nothing to do with that. In fact, again, that case in the fourth DCA case says, you look at the totality of the circumstances. You, you look at the spirit of the, of the statute. Look at the legislative intent of the statute, and you make your determination on that. The final point I have to make is, um, as the court pointed out, I, I went to Florida State. As the court pointed out, Mrs. Stalker is a Florida State graduate. I think she has the ability. I don't think that she, uh, I don't think See, that that's just where because- Mr. Jackson, I think those of us that are went to University of Florida will take issue with that. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I was debating on whether to bring that up or not. <laughs> And, and, for, it up. And, and for the record, this is a joke. I don't want people to think I was serious. It's a I genuinely joke. regret your decision of bringing this up. <laughs> but that's my point. And she is a college graduate. She's not mentally disabled. She's not physically disabled. She has the ability on top of her assets within the corporation, her house, her boat, um, her, her own business. She has the ability to earn a living. Um, and that was that was specifically found by the court. Based on all of this, I would ask your honor to your honors to reverse the trial court's December 23rd, 2020 order um, granting the uh, Ms. Stalker's, Mr. Stalker's claim of exemption and um, reverse the order granting the um, order dissolving the writ of garnishment. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Weber. That concludes our docket for this morning and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, thank you gentlemen.